Today we are starting a very important part of medical education that is about the autonomic nervous system and the drugs acting on the autonomic nervous system, right? When we talk about the pharmacology of autonomic nervous system, we divide the drugs into two main groups. Drugs acting on parasympathetic nervous system and drugs acting on, yes, sympathetic nervous system, right? Let's pose autonomic nervous system pharmacology, right? Primarily, it is divided into two groups. The drugs acting on, drugs acting on sympathetic nervous system and of course drugs acting on parasympathetic nervous system. Now in early part of these lectures we will talk about the drugs acting on sympathetic nervous system. Again the drugs which act on sympathetic nervous system are divided into two. Drugs which mimic the action of sympathetic nervous system. Drugs which mimic, mimic mean the drugs which produce action similar to activation of sympathetic nervous system. So those drugs which increase sympathetic activity in our body or those drugs which produce such effect in our body which is similar to the sympathetic activation, those drugs are called sympathomimetic drugs. Sympathomimetic drugs. Uh, some people also call these drugs adrenergic drugs. Adrenergic drugs. Or these are also called adrenergic agonist. Adrenergic agonist. So this group of drugs, right, sympathomimetic drugs or adrenergic drugs or adrenergic agonist drugs, these are the, this is the group of drug, right, which basically produces pharmacological actions which are very similar to activation of sympathetic nervous system, right. The second group here is the drugs which decrease the actions of sympathetic nervous system and the second group is called sympatho, sympatho, yes, lytic drugs, sympatholytic drugs or they can be called anti-adrenergic, anti-adrenergic drugs or they can be called adrenergic antagonist drugs. So we can say that basically all drugs which work on the sympathetic nervous system, they are primarily divided into two groups, sympathomimetic drugs and sympatholytic drugs. Sympathomimetic drugs are increasing the activity of sympathetic nervous system or they are producing the pharmacological actions which are like the stimulation of sympathetic nervous system, right? And sympatholytic drugs are either decreasing the activity of sympathetic nervous system or they are producing pharmacological actions as if sympathetic nervous system activity is blocked partially or completely. Is that right? Now to really really having a good concept of these drugs we must understand, we must understand the neurophysiology of sympathetic nervous system as well as you must understand neurobiochemistry of sympathetic nervous system because primarily these drugs alter the neurophysiology and neurobiochemistry of the sympathetic nervous system. So now I will talk about that how the sympathetic nervous system normally physiologically work. Once you have understood, understood that very well, that how the sympathetic nervous system can be activated what are the neuronal connections in sympathetic nervous system? What are the neurotransmitters synthesized, stored and released by sympathetic nervous system? 
how those neurotransmitters work on the adrenergic receptors how that what are the different types of adrenergic receptors how those adrenergic receptors are distributed differentially on different tissues in the body and how those sympathetic receptors bring physiological changes in the organ system first we'll understand that then we'll go to the drugs now to really understand that how the sympathetic nervous system work as a component of autonomic nervous system let's go back to some of the neurophysiology uh, we have a very good friend of us here come here please he is mr gavin very soon he will be dr gavin right so this dr gavin will take as our example in which due to some sudden stress his sympathetic nervous system is activated and we will see that once his sympathetic nervous system is activated what are the changes occurring in his different tissues is that right now uh, first of all we will take an example that how is sympathetic nervous system can be suddenly activated because all of you must be knowing already that sympathetic system and parasympathetic system have most of their actions which are opposing to each other and sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system are working automatically right they are most they are not under our will control right they are automatically controlling some aspect of our visceral viscera they are controlling our some of the metabolic functions and sympathetic nervous system activation actually prepares you appropriately to fight with the stress or flight or fly away from the stress again listen when you are under stress right i don't know this may be a physical stress someone is about to beat you or it may be some verbal stress or financial stress or academic stress but anyway if there is sudden increase in your stress level acute increase in your stress level sympathetic nervous system fires right and it prepares your body to fight or flight with the stress if stress is small you will fight it if stress is too big you will fly away is that right and parasympathetic nervous system is dominantly working in your body when you are comfortable for example you are in your bed i mean in your own bed alone reading some novel which is not very stimulating right you have taken food very comfortable no stress stomach is full story is very good right there is no noise no threat financially you are not worried even your wife is not fighting with you i mean one of the unusual days you really feel relaxed that is the moment your central nervous system is activating parasympathetic nervous system right but if sudden stress come central nervous system will switch the balance it will reduce the activity in parasympathetic and increase the activity in sympathetic nervous system right so let's take example of this uh, our friend gavin that uh, one he, what is your age 26 26 he can still afford more romance so one <laughs> one very beautiful night moonlight he was feeling romantic feeling for another new lady but she was not available so he was alone moving on the road and thinking planning you know men plan so many things right so he's planning and feeling good he's very confident he will do so many things sooner or later right and feeling great suddenly a very big suddenly a very big very black dog appears and dog is barking in a very hostile manner and when he looks to the dog he finds that size of the dog is progressively increasing now you understand the central nervous system will appreciate the stress and sympathetic system will start firing and there will be physiological changes in his body right and if dog is really big and black and very hostile of course the sympathetic nervous system will be activated and he will decide to run run away run not towards away away right but <laughs> if unfortunately dog is very small and not very hostile just irritating him maybe he attack the dog you never know human nature 
He attacks the dog and dog's sympathetic nervous system is activated. <laughs> yeah, you never know. This is life. You see? So, okay, in our example, we take a dog which is really big and black and after him and his sympathetic nervous system is activated and he decides to run away. Right? And we'll see what goes in his central nervous system and peripheral nervous system and neuronal sympathetic nervous system activity. You have a seat and we deal with your central nervous system. Right. Actually, how is sympathetic nervous system will be activated? The real activity will initially start in central nervous system. Let's suppose here it is central <coughs> nervous system. You understand, of course, cerebral hemisphere and midbrain, pons, medulla, spinal cord, and cerebellum. Now, the main center, the main center for regulating the activity of the sympathetic and parasympathetic functions is present in the hypothalamus. Now, hypothalamus is located here. You know, here is your anterior pituitary, posterior pituitary. Now, here is your hypothalamus, right? The neurons in the hypothalamus are mainly determining that bell autonomic nervous system should be more having parasympathetic activity or sympathetic activity, right? Now, within the hypothalamus, there is ventromedial area, and you can say anterior area and there is posterior area. Now, posterolateral area. Actually, if I draw the hypothalamus here, now this anteromedial area of hypothalamus, if this area is stimulated, you will have activation in parasympathetic nervous system. But if this postro lateral area in the hypothalamus is stimulated, the neurons in this area, you will have increased sympathetic nervous system activity. Is that right? So basically, hypothalamus is the highest center in the central nervous system, which is controlling the balance between the sympathetic and parasympathetic activity. Is that right? Now, of course, when big black dog is after him, then this part of hypothalamus should be activated. So the end, anterior part of hypothalamus should be having reduced activity and posterolateral sympathetic areas in hypothalamus should be having increased activity so that sympathetic fibers should be stimulated. But the thing is that how the hypothalamus know that there is stress? How hypothalamus knows that there is stress? And how hypothalamus knows that now I should increase the sympathetic activity? Actually, in our central nervous system, there is a large area which, which is concerned with emotions, emotions and behavior and memory. This area I am showing in this diagram as limbic system. In the central nervous system, there are multiple areas which are together as a group called limbic system. The function of the limbic, limbic system is concerned with emotions, with your behavior, with your recent memory, and many other functions. So now, when a big black dog is coming after him, and dog is barking in a hostile fashion, so the, the barking sound through his ears, through his auditory pathways, will go to the auditory cortex. Auditory cortex is in the temporal area. So, barking sound, activate the auditory areas in the temporal cortex and that will give special stimulation to the limbic system. Then if he turns his neck and look at the dog through visual pathway, image of the dog is on the, what is this? Occipital cortex, visual cortex. This will also give information that visual information is very, very hostile to the limbic system. Then maybe he is having some past experiences with the dogs unpleasant past experiences with the dog or maybe he has seen some movies in which dogs are really very hostile 
right? Or he has seen someone suffering with the dog bite. So that memories from other part of cerebral cortex will be also activated and stimulate the limbic system. So now what really happens that limbic cortex or we can say emotional cortex is collecting the information about the recent events, right? And when limbic cortex appreciate that auditory information is stressful, visual information is stressful and the new information which is coming that is related with past information which is also stressful, then those neurons will be activated, those neurons will be activated in limbic system which will stimulate, yeah, which will increase the activity in posterior part of hypothalamus and same neurons at the same time will inhibit the activity on the, yes, parasympathetic nervous system. So the balance will be altered in the hypothalamic activity. So what really happens whenever you are under stress from cerebral cortex information is going of course to the limbic system and when limbic system undergoes stress right it will activate the sympathetic components and inhibit the parasympathetic component present in hypothalamus. Once sympathetic centers in hypothalamus are activated from there the descending pathways will be there right multiple neurons right chain of multiple neurons we call it polyneuronal descending pathways the descending pathways which are made of multiple neurons so these polyneuronal descending pathways will be activated and these pathways will come into lower part of central nervous system and they will activate sympathetic outflow they will activate yes please sympathetic outflow so what really happened when he went under stress his cerebral cortex activated the sympathetic center then hypothalamus which activated the polyneuronal descending sympathetic pathway which will control the sympathetic outflow now sympathetic outflow comes out of central nervous system from spinal cord and which part of the spinal cord from thoracic part of the spinal cord and from the lumbar part of spinal cord so we can divide the spinal cord into okay this is cervical spinal cord this is suppose thoracic spinal cord and this is lumbar and this is sacral cervical thoracic lumbar sacral so what really happens that from here the neurons will bring the information out right now these neurons which are bringing the information out they are present from T1 up to lumbar L2 or 3 right and these neurons are bringing the information out I will just show one pathway large and they end up into some sort of sympathetic ganglion this is sympathetic ganglion so this neuron which is present in the spinal cord you know where exactly it is present in spinal cord let me draw the section of spinal cord in the spinal cord these outgoing neurons have their cell bodies in this area and in this area this is interior horn this is posterior horn and this is called intermediate horn or lateral horn so neurons which are coming from the top they will stimulate the neurons in the lateral horn or intermediate horn. From here, sympathetic outflow will go out and go to the ganglion. Is that right? From the ganglion, postganglionic neurons will be going to the tissues. Now, let's come back and talk about that there is a lot of sympathetic outflow coming from all these areas. Right? Now, one thing we should you should appreciate that sympathetic outflow is diffuse. Diffuse means that multiple areas will be activated because thoracolumbar all the outflow is activated simultaneously. It is not possible that central nervous system activate only fibers going from thoracic segment 6 and not stimulate uh, fiber from 4 and 5. So it's a diffuse outflow. Is that right? Now, how this outflow really work? 
I will take two examples only. Number one, suppose from this neuron, fibers are going out and these fibers go to, yes, this is a nerve ending, right? This is the cell body of the neuron, axon of the neuron and nerve terminal. This terminal is present in a sympathetic ganglion, right? From the sympathetic ganglion, what really happens that postganglionic fibers will go and they will eventually terminate on the, yes, on the tissue. They will terminate on the tissue. Let's suppose this is heart. So then these fibers, postganglionic fibers will release neurotransmitter on the target tissue and target tissue will have receptors here. To make a very good concept, we have to understand that once sympathetic descending pathways are activated and preganglionic neurons fire, right, most of the preganglionic neurons are ending up into sympathetic ganglion and sympathetic ganglion, right, are stimulated and postganglionic fibers will eventually end up into target tissue, right, and at the target tissue, the main neurotransmitter which is released here is, yes, nor epinephrine. But so post ganglionic fibers release nor epinephrine at neuro effector tissue or at the neuro effector site. But remember, these sympathetic pre ganglionic fibers they release a different neurotransmitter. Which neurotransmitter is released from here? Yes, sympathetic pre ganglionic fibers release. Acetylcholine. So you have to remember that norepinephrine is released by the postganglionic nerve ending. Preganglionic nerve endings are releasing acetylcholine. A very important thing. All the neurons which come out of central nervous system are cholinergic. No need to memorize the basic principle. Almost all the neurons which come out of central nervous system are cholinergic. You must be knowing that there are Sympathetic preganglionic coming out, cholinergic. Parasympathetic preganglionic coming out, cholinergic. Even motor neurons going to the skeletal muscle and neuromuscular junctions, they are also cholinergic. So all the neurons which come out of central nervous system are cholinergic. So of course, preganglionic sympathetic fibers are also cholinergic. And here, they act on cholinergic receptors. Right? And these are nicotinic cholinergic receptor. Cholinergic receptors are two types. Nicotinic type and muscarinic type. Nicotinic type. Then action potential is produced over here. And when this action potential arrives at neuromuscular or sorry, at the neuro effector junction, this nerve terminal releases norepinephrine. In this way, sympathetic nervous system releases norepinephrine on the target tissue through their innervation through the nerve supply. But sympathetic nervous system has one more way to work. That some of the preganglionic fibers, they don't go to the ganglion, they go to the adrenal medulla. The sympathetic ganglion are ending up these fibers. Some of the, what are these fibers? Preganglionic sympathetic fibers, they end up on adrenal medulla, right? Suppose this is adrenal medulla. And here it is adrenal gland cortex. And these fibers release here again acetylcholine, which act on the what is this? Adrenal medulla cells and stimulate the adrenal medulla cells. And adrenal medulla cell release adrenal medulla cells release. Epinephrine mainly, no, not norepinephrine, about 80 to 90 percent it releases epinephrine in general circulation. Remember, sympathetic nerve endings are mainly releasing norepinephrine. Nerve ending, NE. Nerve ending releases norepinephrine, NE. But adrenal medulla releases epinephrine. Now of course, actually what is adrenal medulla? They say during the evolution, many ganglion cells come together and lose their axons and they start releasing 
their neurotransmitter into blood and that is how adrenal medulla is made phylogenetically now adrenal medulla releases epinephrine in the general circulation of course on central on sympathetic nervous system stimulation but this epinephrine will circulate in the blood and go to stimulate adrenergic receptor wherever they are present in the body it means that let's suppose there are adrenergic receptors present over here now these adrenergic receptor can be stimulated by the norepinephrine coming from the sympathetic nerve ending or these adrenergic receptors can be stimulated by epinephrine which is present in general circulation so what we learned up to now we learned up to now the sympathetic nervous system releases norepinephrine through the nerve endings and it releases epinephrine into from adrenal medulla into general circulation so receptors at neuro effector sites release norepinephrine through innervation or they receive epinephrine through the general circulation am i clear to everyone there is no problem up to this now we have to come one more thing that how this nerve ending work how this neuro effector site work right how this area is functioning but before we discuss that i will talk about the receptors right that how these receptors are present in the body once epinephrine or norepinephrine come to the adrenergic receptors how adrenergic receptors are stimulated and what changes come into body right after discussing that we will come back to this specialized area this is a very very specialized area because there are about 30 drugs which work only on this nerve ending and its neuro effector site okay i'll leave it up to you mr gavin dog is after you so you must tell me that we should discuss this area first how this small area work i will make a big diagram explain it thoroughly right because there are so many drugs which work in this area should i explain this first or i should explain this later and just tell when epinephrine and norepinephrine is going into your blood how changes are occurring in your body so that you can fly away from the dog tell us about the drugs first you want to know this thing yes okay he want to know first this thing what's going on here right but meanwhile dog may catch you <laughs> okay now let's come here let's suppose this is preganglionic nerve endings right here is the cell body of postganglionic neuron is that right and this is postganglionic neuron axon going on now of course this axon should must end up into tissue what i'm going to do i'm going to make the nerve ending out of proportion very large you understanding this is one of the nerve ending of sympathetic neuron and here is suppose target tissue target cells these are target cells on which neurotransmitter will work right so let's start discussing this area which is pharmacologically extremely important that what's going on in the nerve ending what is going on in the synapse what's going on in this area and how drugs alter the activity here right first we will understand how the neurotransmitter is synthesized stored and released of course all of you know the main neurotransmitter at this point is norepinephrine my question goes to someone very intelligent that norepinephrine which is present here in the synaptic vesicle that norepinephrine is synthesized my question is that norepinephrine is synthesized in the cell body of the neuron and then transported here or that norepinephrine is synthesized locally in the sympathetic nerve ending question goes to this gentleman you think norepinephrine is stored here and synthesized here it is not synthesized in the cell body okay you think it is here anyone who differs what do you think ma'am here that's right actually most this is a basic principle most of the small 
molecular weight small molecular weight neurotransmitters are synthesized within the nerve band then. is that right most so norepinephrine is a small molecular weight neurotransmitter so we'll see how it is synthesized here let's suppose start with very basic from the git of course you take lot of amino acids right proteins you eat amino acids are coming here from the git amino acids are absorbed into yes please general circulation and then these amino acids are distributed to all tissues in the body am i right one of the amino acid which is absorbed from the git that is tyrosine tyrosine is one of the amino acid now what really happens that sympathetic nerve endings are specialized in concentrating tyrosine they there are special pumps here there are special tyrosine uptake mechanisms here in this nerve ending and what these are doing these pumps that they take extracellular tyrosine molecule right and pump it in so in this way all sympathetic nerve endings are very rich in tyrosine once they have taken the tyrosine then an enzyme will work on it i always think tyrosine is like tire you know tire in the car circular so tyrosine is also circular what i mean by circular let me draw the molecular structure of tyrosine it's not difficult again it's circular remember in pharmacology you are not supposed to memorize and remember the molecular structures of the drug except sympathetic nervous system because in the drugs of sympathetic nervous system there is a very big correlation between the molecular structure and function of the drug when you little change the molecular structure function of the drug changes due to that reason only in sympathetic nervous system especially adrenergic drugs you must know some idea about their structure because the function depend on that but remaining pharmacology you are not supposed to remember molecular structures now tyrosine structure tyrosine is like a tire it's a benzene ring one hydroxylation here right what is the ch2 ch2 right what is there the methyl ethyl group here and then with that there is amino group here and there is carboxylation now this is basically tyrosine fundamental structure so what really happens tyrosine is pumped into nerve ending right in the nerve ending there is the enzyme the first enzyme which will work on the tyrosine what is the name of this enzyme who is going to tell me the name of this enzyme tyrosine hydroxylase that is called yes tyrosine hydroxylase so tyrosine hydroxylase work on this molecule listen keep this basic molecule in your mind this is the mother compound or i don't know father compound of the sympathetic neurotransmitters and drug all the basic compounds most of them are derived from this structure now first you do hydroxylation of the tyrosine so when you do the hydroxylation what really happens here a hydroxyl group is added what is added over here hydroxylation is done and hydroxyl group is added over there there is one question you know epinephrine norepinephrine and dopamine and isoprenaline or isoprotaninol all of these drugs are called catecholamine also have you heard of it epinephrine norepinephrine dopamine isoprotaninol all of them are also called catecholamines why we call them catecholamine question goes to that lady okay she want to know the answer she doesn't want to know the question anyone can answer because oh, these again again and again when you read the books you know my duty is to make books easy for you you enjoy the books so many books they mention epinephrine or norepinephrine or dopamine or isoprotaninol they are catecholamines so who is going to impress me by telling why they are called catecholamines yeah you want to impress me 
No, no, no. I, I want to know why they are called catecholamines. Of course, they have catechol ring. What is catechol ring? I've given you idea. Please impress me. Catechol ring. What is catechol ring? Listen, any benzene ring with three and four hydroxylation is called catechol ring. That's it. Yeah, now you are impressing me after the time. You say, of course, catechol has a mine group also. So basically, catecholamines are the compound which have amino group and catechol ring. What is catechol ring? Catechol ring is, yes, dihydroxy benzene ring, where one hydroxyl is at three position and four position. Am I right? Later on, we will see in the lectures of drugs that how you change the hydroxylations and drugs actions change, right? So that is why because epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine and isoproterenol, all of them have this ring structure. So they are called catechol compounds and in the end they have amino group. So catecholamines. Is that right? But whenever we remove these catechol, these hydroxylations, we say drugs are non-catecholamines. In pharmacology we say sympathomimetic drugs are catecholamines and non-catecholamines. So you have to remember whenever we say drug is non-catecholamine, I think its ears are removed. These hydroxylations are removed. Anyway, so tyrosine gets hydroxylated here. And once it is hydroxylated, the new compound is called dopa. Now this compound which is hydroxylated, this is called dopa. This hydroxylated compound, right? And once dopa is produced, right, then what really happens in the next step is, yes, now next enzyme will come into action and convert the dopa into, yes please, dopa mean. Now, how the dopa can be converted into dopamine? It's very easy. Bring the, what is this, carbon dioxide out. So when this molecule will puff out carbon dioxide, it will puff out carbon dioxide, it will become dopamine. So the next enzyme which should be working here should be dopa decarboxylase, working on the dopa Yes, and removing what? Carboxyl group. So, dopa D carboxylase. So, this dopa D carboxylase, right, it work on the dopa, and what comes out? Remove the carboxyl group or carbon dioxide. So, look here, we have lost this carboxyl group. Right, we can make it like this, it is lost. Carbon dioxide, like a balloon of a baby. It is going away. And who has done this function? Dopa decarboxylase. And now what is the structure present over there? Dopamine. Right, so you take ty uh, tyrosine and hydroxylase, you get dopa. You take the enzyme dopa decarboxylase, do the decarboxylation of dopa and you end up with, yes, what is this? dopamine <coughs> right now as soon as dopamine is produced there's a trouble if it is a, if it remains here in the cytosol it will be immediately destroyed you know why it will be destroyed who knows because it will be immediately destroyed and prevent the destruction of this molecule we should pump this molecule into a membrane bound vesicle there is a membrane bound vesicle over here, right? And there are special vesicular transport system. And this vesicular transport system should take the dopamine and pump into vesicle. Now question is that once dopamine is synthesized, it is immediately pumped into what? Neuronal vesicles. Why? Because it will be destroyed outside. Who will destroy it? There is a cat there. Cat, cat. Let me tell you. There are mitochondria here. You know mitochondrias? 
what is the relationship of mitochondria here with this discussion on the surface of mitochondria there is a very very dangerous enzyme right it is just like a cat i feel this is expressed on the surface of mitochondria and this enzyme is called monoamine oxidase this enzyme can do oxidation of monoamines now what is monoamine yes gavin don't forget about the dog yes ja yeah. what is monoamines yes ronald compounds which are neurotransmitters which are derivative of single amino acid they are monoamines right from single amino acid now what are monoamines dopamine is monoamine it is derived from tyrosine norepinephrine is monoamine because norepinephrine is derivative of dopamine epinephrine is monoamine because epinephrine is derivative of norepinephrine tyrosine make many monoamines one amino monoamine from tyrosine is <coughs> dopamine other monoamine from the tyrosine is yes norepinephrine another monoamine from tyrosine is epinephrine is that right then from another amino acid tryptophan we can make 5 hydroxy tryptamine serotonin so tryptophan is amino acid from where we can derive serotonin so serotonin is also monoamine is that right am i clear even neurotransmitter histidine is monoamine the derivative of histamine and what about acetylcholine yes it is not monoamine it's not derived from any amino acid right so you know what are monoamines so in many of the nerve endings in central nervous system or peripheral nervous system there is monoamine oxidase on the mitochondria and these monoamine oxidases can do catabolism of epinephrine norepinephrine serotonin dopamine so you must know they are involved in multiple metabolic destructions of multiple neurotransmitters anyway let's come back actually if dopamine remains here attention please dopamine epinephrine norepinephrine all of them can be destroyed by mao mao mean monoamine oxidase so as soon as dopamine is synthesized it is captured into vesicle so that it is not destroyed by monoamine oxidase am i clear so dopamine is taken in now listen carefully if this nerve neuron is dopaminergic if it was dopaminergic there will be no further reaction dopamine will be stored and released but our neuron is not dopaminergic it is noradrenergic this neuron is noradrenergic neuron so it means still one more work need to be done Conver conversion of dopamine into norepinephrine so within with the wall of this membrane there is a very special enzyme here right now this enzyme is attached in the internal wall of the internal side of the vesicular membrane right what this enzyme is doing who is going to tell me it is going to do work on the dopamine one more action what is that action dopamine beta hydroxylation there will be one more hydroxylation done by this right by this enzyme and this point this is a beta carbon so at this carbon it will add what hydroxylation and when this point gets hydroxylation now the compound is called yes please this compound is called norepinephrine so what really happens that dopamine is acted upon by this drug uh, sorry uh, by this enzyme the name of the enzyme is dopamine beta 
hydroxylase. In some book, they call it dopamine beta oxidase, it's the same thing. But anyway, majority of the authors, they write it dopamine beta hydroxylase. So, those neurons which release norepinephrine in their vesicle, this enzyme is present. But those neurons which release dopamine, they don't have this enzyme. Am I right? Claro? Now, we have converted dopamine into yes please, nor epinephrine. In this way, these vesicles keep on concentrating the dopamine and converting into norepinephrine and norepinephrine molecules keep on accumulating. Then what will happen? What will happen if norepinephrine molecules keep on accumulating? The osmotic power, osmotic pressure in the vesicle will become very high, it may automatically burst. And we don't want that. So, this norepinephrine is complexed with some proteins inside called chromogranin or with ATP and some ascorbic acid. So, what happens? This norepinephrine is complexed with some internal proteins and ATP. So, norepinephrine molecules will be binding with them. And you know, osmotic pressure is directly proportional to the number of molecules, not to the size of the molecule. So when they are kept together like a group, osmotically they act not as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. They don't act as 6 molecules osmotically. As a group they act as 1 molecule. Am I problem up to this? Okay. Now norepinephrine is stored over here. Right? Then, when stimulation will come, you remember that stress was appreciated here? Sympathetic, poly, Neuronal descending pathways were activated and then sympathetic outflow was activated and then eventually these nerve endings should be activated and it should release the norepinephrine. Now we have to talk about how the norepinephrine is released. Of course it is released when action potential comes over here. You know when this neuron is stimulated, wave of depolarization followed by the wave of repolarization will reach here. How? the depolarization of this nerve ending will lead to the release of norepinephrine. Yes, please. You know, when depolarization will come, what it will say? Please go out, vesicle. Excellent. Actually, there are depolarization sensitive calcium channels present in this nerve ending. This nerve ending has, yes, please, depolarization sensitive calcium channels. So when depolarization is sweeping, coming here, Depolar voltage gated sodium channels will be opened, right? Sodium will depolarize the influx of sodium will depolarize the membrane. And when membrane undergo depolarization, the depolarization sensitive calcium channels open. And when these calcium channels open, lot of calcium comes in. Very good. So what this calcium will do? My friend was telling, what this calcium will do? Very good. That ca incoming calcium will help the vesicle to fuse, vesicular membrane to fuse with nerve endings membrane and both membranes should fuse and release the content. But exactly how this fusion occur, let me tell you. Actually, on this membrane there are special type of proteins attached and these proteins which are attached here, these are called synaptobravin. Synaptobravin. And there are complementary proteins which are present over here, right? And these are called syntaxins. So you just like actin and myosin, they can, as actin and myosin can interact in the same way, some proteins on vesicular membrane and some other proteins on the neuronal membrane, they are having a capability to interact with each other. But what really happens? that syntaxin is an off state. It is like this and it cannot fit. But as soon as calcium comes in, look here. As soon as calcium comes in, calcium will bind here and here. And both calcium will repel each other, you know. And this pocket will open. So this will be wide open to welcome this thing. This thing is synaptobravin. Right? Here and here. Then synaptobravin and this will interact with each other. And that will lead to the fusion of this membrane, vesicular membrane with the, what is this funny thing, neuronal membrane. 
right? And in this way, this membrane, okay, I'll make it thick. I'll make it different color membrane. This is what? Vesicular membrane, right? So this vesicular membrane will fuse with the, what is this? Cell membrane. And you know what will happen? Norepinephrine will be regurgitated out. You call this process exocytosis, right? Norepinephrine is released for its action. Right, but this membrane is very specialized membrane. You remember this membrane was having special transporters. This membrane had special type of enzymes attached with it. Am I right? Right, and many other transporters. So as soon as this membrane of vesicle fuses with this, it releases norepinephrine. And you know what happens after that? Then this membrane when this, after that, this membrane will be taken back. You know how it will be taken back? From inside of the cell, special type of proteins will bind here. These proteins are called clathrins. What are these? Clathrins, right? Clathrins will bind with this membrane and pull it back. So empty vesicle will come back so that this vesicle can be used Again, this is very important piece, piece of patch of membrane. It should go fuse, release its content and recapture back into nerve ending to be reused again. Of course, when it comes back, it is empty. Am I clear? There is no problem here. Now, once the norepinephrine release, what it is doing there? It is going to act on presynaptic membrane as well as postsynaptic membrane on the receptors, right? Now, when, when it act on post synaptic membrane, maybe this tissue has, let's suppose this tissue has receptors and this receptor is adrenergic receptor. Now, adrenergic receptors are classified as alpha receptors and beta receptors. Alpha receptors are primarily alpha 1 and alpha Two and beta 1 are primarily beta 1, beta 2 and a modified beta 1 which is also called beta 3, right? We'll discuss receptors in detail later. Now what really happens that most of alpha 1, beta 1 and beta 2, they are present post synaptically, they're present on the tissue. So let's suppose there is alpha 1 receptor present over here. Remember all the adrenergic receptors are 7 pass receptors coupled with intracellular G proteins. This is alpha 1 adrenergic receptor coupled with G Q. We will discuss that later. Then maybe target tissue have a different type of adrenergic receptor and this is not alpha 1, this is suppose beta 1 adrenergic receptor, right? And this beta 1 adrenergic receptor is coupled usually with G S G stimulatory protein. Some other tissue may have yes beta 2 adrenergic receptor which are also coupled with G stimulatory and here it is beta 2 adrenergic receptor. And as here is alpha 1, alpha 2 receptors are present mostly at presynaptic membrane of the this is alpha 2 adrenergic receptor it is present on presynaptic membrane so when norepinephrine is released this norepinephrine will work on yes depending upon what receptors are present over there it may work on alpha 2 receptors which are presynaptically present it may work on alpha 1 adrenergic receptors, uh, beta 1 adrenergic receptors or beta 2 adrenergic receptors. And while acting at these places, it will produce its actions when these receptors are 
stimulated right it will produce its action what will be the action of these receptors i will discuss later right alpha 1 receptors are on different tissues and they produce different action as compared to the suppose beta 1 receptor but about alpha 2 receptor i want to discuss right now whenever sympathetic nerve endings release norepinephrine a small component of norepinephrine work on presynaptic membrane on alpha 2 receptors these alpha 2 receptors are coupled with g inhibitory protein and g inhibitory protein will lead to reduced cyclic amp level not going into detail but some of you may be knowing that when g inhibitory protein is stimulated when g inhibitory protein is stimulated it inhibits the <coughs> yes adenylyl cyclase and when adenylyl cyclase is inhibited that will lead to reduced production of cyclic amp right so there will be reduced production of cyclic amp plus g inhibitory protein also open the potassium channels it opens potassium channels and intracellular potassium start moving out so what will happen when epinephrine or norepinephrine work on alpha 2 receptors right then there is reduced cyclic amp levels and there is increased loss of potassium when cell is losing potassium it is losing positive charges it become electrically very negative so when it become very negative electrically it become hyperpolarized membrane become more polarized to the negative side when it become hyperpolarized then what happen it becomes difficult to stimulate this membrane so when it becomes difficult to stimulate further electrical stimulation of membrane become difficult when membrane is losing too much potassium is that right it become too much electrically negative it becomes difficult to depolarize is that right when it becomes difficult to depolarize so electrically this nerve ending become inhibited and further release of norepinephrine is reduced so it means this mechanism is auto inhibitory secondly reduced cyclic amp will lead to reduced activity of protein kinase a and when activity of protein kinase a is reduced right that will lead to reduced activity of these enzymes so even synthesis of neurotransmitter is reduced so what really happens that this is an what is this this receptor act as auto inhibitory molecule that as more and more norepinephrine is released norepinephrine stimulate alpha 2 receptors and they give inhibitory signals by losing the potassium and by re by reducing the intracellular cyclic amp this nerve ending become inhibited and further release of norepinephrine is reduced in this way this is an auto inhibitory loop is there any question here then let's talk about we i will discuss this later that what are the actions on alpha 1 receptors beta 1 and beta 2 once norepinephrine has done presynaptic and postsynaptic actions what happens to norepinephrine it keep on staying there or what happens to norepinephrine question goes to yes ma'am what happens to this norepinephrine yes sir yeah it is degraded okay uh, my friend is telling that acetylcholine oh no my god why acetylcholine i talk i should say norepinephrine which is released my friend is saying it is degraded what is the enzyme which destroys it here i tell you whatever will be your answer it will be absolutely wrong because it is not degraded here but what is your answer okay <laughs> listen listen carefully this, this is the major different in adrenergic and cholinergic system when acetylcholine is released there is acetylcholine esterase there in the synaptic area and acetylcholine esterase destroys the acetylcholine so termination of action of acetylcholine is by destruction of acetylcholine but noradrenergic system does not have any big amount of 
any enzyme to destroy norepinephrine or epinephrine or dopamine at this site. Right? So, norepinephrine is not destroyed here. Right? What we do with it? Primarily, it is like a ball, you know, ball. You throw a ball, it touched there with the elastic, you pull back. Then you again throw and pull it back. You reuse this again and again. It's very valuable, tiny molecule. We don't want to destroy it. Then there will be too much energy, you know. You keep on getting angry for small things. You're releasing norepinephrine. And then if all the norepinephrine is destroyed, then you cannot afford to be angry again. Is that right? But actually you can be angry with your wife, then with your own self, with your child, maybe with your studies, or maybe angry with some fly or mosquito, it depends on your personality, right? So why you can become angry, irritated again and again? You can afford so many episodes of stress in a day <laughs> because norepinephrine which is released, 80% of that is recaptured, restored to be used again. Is that right? So actually once it has done its action there, 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 it bounces back. And here is someone waiting for it to pull it back. And there is a very special transporter here. There is no need to remember that it is 7, uh, 12 pass molecule. Just remember there is special reuptake mechanism here. This special reuptake mechanism is called reuptake 1 mechanism. This is also monoamine uptake system. What really it does, the norepinephrine which was released here and doing its action very rapidly most of it this norepinephrine will be reuptaken by the system and it is back happily right but you know life is not that good even for the molecules who is waiting here now, so it depends on luck, sheer luck, that some of these molecules before they are attacked by the Mao, these molecules are reuptaken back and they become really very, very happy. They are back to. But some of these molecules which are reuptaken, if they are not rapidly enough recaptured by the vesicle, they will be treated by this Mao. And when they will come out of Mao, they are degraded, they are lost. Right, they are going into catabolic pathway. Am I clear? So what really happens that major pathway by which adrenergic activity is terminated, right? That is by the norepinephrine reuptake. But you have to remember, this is not only norepinephrine reuptake. Even dopaminergic neuron also recapture most of the dopamine. Even serotonergic neurons recapture most of the serotonin. Why am I stressing so much this pathway? Because there are many drugs which work at this point. Stop it. We'll talk about this in the next section, just after a few minutes. Right? So this is reuptake 1. This is reuptake 1 mechanism. But some of this may be. Some of it may be attacked by another enzyme present on postsynaptic membrane. And that enzyme is not MAO. There may be another enzyme here, right? Okay. What this enzyme is going to do? You know what this enzyme is going to do is that it will take norepinephrine and when norepinephrine will come out, it has lost it one component. You will tell me which component is lost from this molecule. Yes, guess it. Yeah, I am making the molecule and you tell me which component is lost. Should I? Yes, please. I have completed the molecule and you did not tell me which component is lost. This hydroxyl is lost. This enzyme has eaten up that hydroxyl point. Right? Not only, not sorry, sorry. Not only hydroxyl is lost, rather it has added methyl group here. Right? Methyl group. You know what is the advantage of adding methyl group? When you do methylation of a molecule, 
molecule become less polar and more yes it become less polar is that right so hydroxyl is lost and methyl group is added what is the name of this enzyme actually this let me tell you this enzyme is in present in very high concentration in liver also this is one of the very important enzyme to destroy the catecholamines what there are two enzymes which you are supposed to know for destruction of catecholamine. One enzyme is monoamine oxidase and other is catechol O methyl transferase. Have you heard of it? COMT? COMT. It has attacked the catechol ring and transferred a methyl group there. So it is called catechol O methyl transferase. Is that right? So what really happens? How the action of norepinephrine is terminated, most of it is recaptured and whatever is recaptured, most of it is restored in the vesicle. A small component may be destroyed by monoamine oxidase present in the nerve ending on mitochondrion and a part of it may be destroyed by catechol O methyl transferase attached with the post and on the effector tissue. And part of it may diffuse into general, yes, part of it may diffuse into very small component, may diffuse into general circulation. And this epinephrine or norepinephrine which has gone into general circulation, eventually it will be catabolized by liver or by kidney. Both of these tissues are very rich in monoamine oxidase and catechol O methyl transferase, right. This is a very basic biochemistry related with this system. We'll have a break and after the break we'll discuss that at every step which drugs are working and how they alter the synthesis, storage, release and action of adrenergic neurotransmitter. Right? Let's have a break. Now we have discussed in detail the structure and function at neuro effector site of adrenergic system, right? Now this area where adrenergic nerve ending are acting at the effector site, right? This area or this operatus is target for many, many sympathomimetic and sympatholytic drugs. Many drugs either increase the activity in this area or decrease the activity in this area. So let's see how the drugs work in this area and start step by step. First of all, we'll talk about the drugs which work earliest step. The drug which work at the earliest step is methyl tyrosine. Methyl tyrosine. Methyl tyrosine means that methyl group is there with tyrosine, right? Now this methyl tyrosine This is a drug. What this drug will do? It will enter into this nerve ending through the same pathway. And once it enter, what this drug is doing? This drug will capture this enzyme. Methyl tyrosine. Actually methyl tyrosine is of course structurally very similar with the tyrosine. An enzyme rather than working on tyrosine Enzyme unfortunately or fortunately grabs methyl tyrosine. And once methyl tyrosine stick to the enzyme, it really stick it forever. So what happens? Can enzyme work for the original pathway? No. Again listen. The function of tyrosine hydroxylase is to convert the tyrosine into dopa. But we have given a drug, methyl tyrosine, which is structurally analog of tyrosine. And when methyl tyrosine enter into nerve ending, it will also bind with the enzyme. Even though this enzyme binds with the methyl tyrosine, but after that enzyme cannot work forward. It cannot convert methyl tyrosine into any further product. So we say that in the presence of methyl tyrosine, enzymes are engaged into with the drug and they are no more free to convert tyrosine into dopa. So normal 
Catecholamine means synthesis is blocked, right? So eventually there will be no tyrosine going into dopa and eventually there will be less dopamine, less norepinephrine and at adrenergic neuroeffector areas, total norepinephrine activity will be increased or decreased. It will be decreased. So this drug will be sympatholytic. So methyl tyrosine will be working as a sympatholytic drug by binding to the tyrosine hydroxylase, reducing its function and reducing the synthesis of norepinephrine. So this drug is inhibiting the synthetic pathway. Now we come to the next drug. There is another drug here. That drug is going to bind with this. with this pump, this is dopamine transporter, right? That drug will bind with this pump It's a very angry looking drug and you know what it does? It block this transporter, it stop this transporter. If there is a drug or substance which is taken up by these nerve endings and inside the nerve ending, if this drug inhibit these transporter, right, not only here, this will block, inhibit this transporter here also. When this transporter is inhibited, can dopamine enter into vesicle? No. And if dopamine cannot enter into vesicle, dopamine will be destroyed by monoamine oxidase. And vesicle will be empty, vesicles will be empty, they, they won't have norepinephrine in, right? And this drug work on these transporter, these transporters are transporting the dopamine into vesicle, they also transport epinephrine and norepinephrine. So once, once you have given this drug to any person, in that person's nerve endings Dopamine uptake, epinephrine and norepinephrine uptake is, uptake is blocked and all these vesicles become empty. Now there will be funny situation. The funny situation will be action potential will come, calcium will come in, vesicles will move but they won't release anything because they don't have anything. I mean it's a very bad, uh, you should make a movement against this drug. But first you tell me what is the name of this drug. I will tell you something else before I tell you the name of drug. Initially this drug was, there was, <coughs> initially this drug was used as anti-hypertensive drug because it was reducing the adrenergic activity in the body. But later on doctors stopped using this drug. Do you know why? Because many of the people who took this drug, they committed suicide. Do you know why? Because of course when this drug was blocking this vesicular transport, now endings were not releasing epinephrine or norepinephrine, so blood pressure went down. Is that right? But in the central nervous system, adrenergic activity, noradrenergic activity and dopaminergic activity went down. And these are the neurons which keep you excited about even small things in the life. And when you are not excited by anything and you are really down all the time, you are going to depression. So many of these patients eventually committed suicide and once doctors found this, this is no more a uh, very important antihypertensive drug. But still I don't know it's very important in USMLE and other exams and CQs. Because if you know how this drug works, it means you really know how this nerve ending works. So please tell me what is the name of this drug? Anyone? Uh, alpha dopa. It is not alpha dopa. It is not any dopa. Right? Even though I appreciate that you know that alpha methyl dopa reduces the blood pressure and that also produces sometimes depression but that depression is usually not well known for the suicide because alpha methyl dopa is still used in many countries heavily because it is one of the very inexpensive drugs. So it is not that drug. All of you have heard of this drug. This is called reserpine. Have you heard of reserpine? This is exactly where the reserpine hit you, right? What is this? This friend is very unfriendly. This is Razor 
pin right am i clear no problem so how the razor pin work razor pin is actively taken up into nerve endings and in the nerve endings it will block the vesicular transport mechanism so vesicles cannot accumulate dopamine norepinephrine epinephrine and vesicles remain empty and whatever dopamine is there it will be destroyed by monoamine oxidase i think this is unfair with the nerve ending right we have to report to some federal authority and the worst thing which they do is that they produce depression is that right now we go to another drug there is another drug another group of drug and that drug put a sign here stop now you are going to tell me what is the name of this drug right yes this drug right so you have to tell me what is the name of this drug the major function of this drug is it does not allow the yes does not allow the vesicles to fuse with the membrane and it stops that activity and it blocks the release of neurotransmitter this blocks the release of neurotransmitter again let's recap methyl tyrosine blocks the synthesis of neurotransmitter razor bean blocks the storage of neurotransmitter now this funny guy is there he does not allow the vesicles to fuse with the membrane so it redu reduces the release of neurotransmitter so who is going to tell me the name of this drug yes please who will tell me you don't want to tell me the name of this drug you know that have you heard of guanadryl britalium never heard of it okay you hear it now this drug is called guanadryl guana guana g u a guanadryl d r i l guanadryl or another friend of this drug is Britalium. Don't worry, you will hear many things in your life first time. Guanadryl or Britalium. These drugs are also acting on sympathetic nerve endings and they reduce the release of neurotransmitter. Right? So, what we have learned up to now methyl tyrosine reduces the synthesis of neurotransmitter. Right? Razorpine reduces the storage of neurotransmitter and guanadryl and britalium reduces the release of neurotransmitters so it means all of these drugs are sympathetic all of these drugs are sympathetic right now i tell you the real real funny guy there is another drug which does not reduces the synthesis which does not reduces the storage which does not reduces the release of the neurotransmitter mechanism but still that drug can reduce sympathetic activity by acting on this nerve ending there is a drug which does not reduce uh, reduces synthesis storage or release of neurotransmitter but still that drugs act on the sympathetic nerve endings and reduces sympathetic activity who is going to tell me it's my time to be impressed again that does not inhibit anything okay he, uh, he he said that that drug may be inhibiting the calcium influx uh, theoretically it's good to think like that but practically it is disastrous because if a drug can block these calcium channels these calcium channels are identical in almost all the neurons in central nervous system 
all nervous system will shut down. No neurotransmission will be there. So this should not be called drug. That will be a big, big toxin, world class toxin. Don't report to any terrorist. Yes. Pardon? Then what it is doing there? Excellent. Dr. Nakita has given a very good answer. Actually, there is a drug, you know, which was which is mimicking the original neurotransmitter, but that is a false neurotransmitter. As Mr. Gavin, he marries a very beautiful girl, but later on he discovers she is not girl. <laughs> That's a tragedy, isn't it? That is, you can say, pseudo woman. So in the same way, there can be pseudo drugs, pseudo neurotransmitters. He may be happily doing everything and in the end is a disaster, right? Same happened, there is a drug, okay, look at this drug, look at its facial expression, very happy, it's going to fool you, right? This drug is what you were telling, alpha methyl dopa, what is the name of this drug? Yes, alpha methyl dopa. It is coming with the name of Eldomet, right? It is one of the very commonly used antihypertensive drugs. And of course, at this stage, I will not tell. One of the side effects is CNS, little bit depression, and Coombs test is positive. I will not tell you. Just listen to the mechanism, how it works. Alpha methyl dopa, what it is doing? It is active, it is taken up by the membrane, by the transport mechanism, right? Of course, which transport mechanism? Yes. Same, which is taking up the tyrosine, right? So it is taken up by the same transport mechanism in alpha methyl dopa. And it is going to fool, right? It will reach up to dopa. Now what is alpha methyl dopa? It is just a dopa molecule with methyl group, right? So dopa decarboxylase will be fooled. It will work on alpha methyl dopa and decarboxylase that enzyme. You know, alpha methyl dopa enter into the system and dopa decarboxylase work on this and from here what will go out? Carbon dioxide. This enzyme is working on alpha methyl dopa, right? And alpha methyl dopa will be converted into what? Alpha methyl dopamine. Now this is a difference. Please compare in your mind. Methyl tyrosine get engaged with the enzyme and does not leave the enzyme, block the enzyme. But alpha methyl dopa is a happy go lucky type thing. It goes in, it binds with the enzyme, let the enzyme work on it, and it gets converted into alpha methyl dopamine and then leave the enzyme. So enzyme is fooled. It is working on pseudo compound. Enzyme is supposed to work on dopa, but it is working on alpha methyl dopa and converting, not converting the dopa into dopamine, rather converting the alpha methyl dopa into alpha methyl dopamine. And then its fooling attitude continues. Then it fools this neuro, what is this, uptake mechanism. And alpha methyl dopa is concentrated into what is this place? Yeah, into vesicles. And it arrives there happily. Instead of dopamine, you find alpha methyl dopamine. What has happened? Alpha methyl dopa entered into nerve ending and there it got converted into alpha methyl dopamine. Then alpha methyl dopamine is also concentrated in. Now cell is, uh, vesicle is not having dopamine, it is having yes, alpha methyl dopa. And fooling continues. Look at this joker. That this enzyme will also work on that and convert alpha methyl dopa into alpha methyl norepinephrine. It will convert alpha methyl dopamine, alpha methyl dopamine into alpha methyl norepinephrine. Now your vesicles will be full of alpha methyl norepinephrine, not full of normal epinephrine. So this will sit over there in the vesicle and whenever action potential comes, what will be released out? What will be released out? Of course, whatever, whatever is stored there, you are it's still. Now it's dancing because it is fooled so much. And now what is out? Alpha methyl, alpha methyl, nor 
epinephrine and this does not love to bind and stimulate these things. The real action is not there. Gavin, do you understand what goes wrong? The real action is not there, right? So all the, this nerve ending apparatus is fooled, right? It is somehow doing a lot of hard work to reach up to the action, but there is no action because it has taken a pseudo molecule that is not dopa but alpha methyl dopa and dopa decarboxylase convert alpha methyl dopa into alpha methyl dopamine then this is also fooled and concentrate alpha methyl dopamine into the vesicle then this enzyme is also fooled and convert alpha methyl dopamine into alpha methyl norepinephrine and this keep on happily sitting there until action potential come calcium influx occur and vesicles happily fuse but they regurgitate this happy lady what is that alpha methyl norepinephrine and that does not like to have the real action on these things so sympathetic activity will go down yes please and this is happening so this drug is not blocking the thyroxine thyroxine is it yeah so then i would assume that there is a competition between the, the drug and the normal process with the dopamine carboxylase enzyme now if the drug will have a special activity for the dopamine to be like uh, let me tell you, you are thinking that methyl tyrosine is also de dealing with the end. Methyl tyrosine, uh, you are thinking that tyrosine is going in, and when this is also going in, maybe less tyrosine is going in? I'm asking if that drug has an effect on the decrease of tyrosine. Yeah, it does. When this drug is going in, tyrosine uptake will be reduced, but tyrosine uptake is not significantly reduced because this nerve ending has a lot of tyrosine. Uh, transporters, so they don't get saturated. So real competition is not at this site. Uh, let me tell you, your question was that when this drug is going through transporters in, then tyrosine uptake will be blocked. Answer is no significant blockage because nerve ending has lot of excessive tyrosine uptake transporter machines, right? Yes. Due to that reason, uh, nerve ending keep on taking the tyrosine as well as keep on taking alpha methyl dopa. The real problem occur at this level that all the enzyme machinery, vesicular uptake machinery and this machinery, this become busy with the pseudo, pseudo substance and original substances, enzymes are not available to work on them. The real difference in methyl tyrosine and alpha methyl dopa is that methyl tyrosine is a lady who is not lady. Methyl tyrosine is a pseudo lady, it will grab you and never leave. Is that right? But this will fool you, then fool someone else, and fool someone else, too busy. Is that right? Am I clear? So which, will, which you will like? Methyl tyrosine or alpha methyl dopa? Yeah, at least you will get rid of that, right? But don't worry, there are a lot more coming if you keep on taking that drug regularly, right? Anyway, any question up to this? There is no question. Okay, then we can move forward that there are some other drugs which are up to now, all these drugs are sympatholytic. The methyl tyrosine reduces the synthesis. Reserpine reduces the vesicular uptake mechanism. Alpha methyl dopa is full, okay, guanadryl and britallium reduces the transmitter release. And alpha methyl dopa is too much uh, funny that it uses all the pathway and in the end up, and the nerve ending end up in releasing pseudo neurotransmitter. Am I clear? So these are all sympatholytic drugs acting at different sites at the nerve end end. Now we come to sympatholytic drugs which can block the receptors because to reduce the sympathetic activity can be divided in two ways. Either sympathetic activity can be reduced by reducing the function of nerve ending or sympathetic activity can be reduce, reduced by blocking these receptors. So there are drugs which can block these receptors, right? Now, first of all, these drugs which block these receptors, we call them, yes, adrenergic receptor antagonist. Antagonist, right? How do you define an antagonist? Yes, I'm about to be impressed again, I think. Yes, Nakita, what is antagonist? How do you define antagonist? For example, someone is acting against you, his antagonist. We are talking about molecular level. Yeah. At receptor level, really. 
Okay, before you tell me new concepts, I answer. Look, this is a very simple little bit reference to the basic concept. Look here. There, these are two receptors here. Okay, I'll make it uh, rather same color, which is there. This is one receptor and there is another receptor, right? Now listen, these are similar receptors, suppose these are similar receptors and they are giving intracellular signals, is that right? The receptor has two functions, number one it should bind the, bind the substance and then give the intracellular signaling here. Now imagine the difference between agonist and antagonist. Agonist will come and bind with the receptor, right? Suppose this is the agonist. Agonist will come and bind with the receptor plus Now what agonist is doing? Number one, it is binding the receptor. By these two side thing, it is binding with the receptor. Right, when a substance binds with the receptor, we say substance has affinity for the receptor. But when it stimulates the central point, right, then the real message goes in. And when this drug will stimulate the central point and message will go in, we say it is having intrinsic activity in the receptor. So this drug can bind with the receptor and stimulate the receptor. When a drug binds with the receptor and stimulates the receptor, we say that it has affinity for the receptor as well as it activates the intrinsic activity for the receptor. Such drugs or substances which bind with the receptor and increase the action of the receptor, we call them agonist. What is the difference between agonist and antagonist? Look at it. Antagonist is binding over here, right? but it does not stimulate the central point. So antagonist has affinity but not intrinsic activity. You are understanding it? So what is this now? Antagonist because original drug under these circumstances, this original drug cannot work, right? So actually this is antagonizing the action of the other substance, right? So what is the difference between agonist and antagonist? Agonist has capability to bind and also stimulate. Antagonist binds but does not stimulate. Is that right? You want an example or you understand it? Okay, that's good. Uh, still I tell you something. I don't know why it's, I'm away from my wife for last one and a half year and all examples are related with these things. My mind is really getting something. Okay, let's suppose when your wife is very happy with you. She is having affinity for you and intrinsic stimulation. So it becomes agonist woman. But suppose she is angry with you, very angry with you. It's a trouble. She is still all the time with you but does not allow any other woman to come near. So what is this? She becomes an antagonist entity. That is why you get very frustrated. You are understanding it. Right? The affinity is there but no intrinsic activity. That's what frustrate. Isn't it? So real difference between agonist and antagonist drug is, agonist drug bind and stimulate. Antagonist bind but does not stimulate and you feel miserable, isn't it? Right? Do you know what is partial agonist? Yes. Yeah, I think your imagination is on wings. Yes. What is partial agonist? It has less uh, Okay, that's good. Let's pause. Yeah, he's right. Uh, but let me make a diagram. When full agonist bind, suppose it is giving double action in. And of course here there is no action. When it bind, it does a double action. So what is it? Full agonist. When it binds and there is no action, it keeps around you but no action. What is it? Anta full antagonist. And okay, I have to sacrifice my diagram a little. But I think it's worth it. And now we make another receptor and see how the partial
agonist is working. Partial agonist is some girl's friend and only in the beginning of the relationship. They will bind, right? And partially stimulate. But there's no action here. So there is an intrinsic activity, but not full. There's only partial intrinsic activity, other is not there. So what is this? Partial agonist bind but stimulate partially. Is that right? So this is partial agonist. What is partial antagonist? How do you define partial antagonist? I have to make another diagram. No, this is partial antagonist also. When you have a girlfriend in early relationship, right? She is just checking are you worth to be father of her children or not. During that time just to keep you around, she have affinity and partial agonist activity but not the full action. Right? But unfortunately, she does not allow the other person to come and have full action. If she is keeping her eyes open and does not trust you fully, if she is wise. Right? So what is this? That this molecule itself is producing little stimulation, but does not allow the other molecule to come and do the full stimulation. So this molecule, this molecule is partial agonist as well as partial antagonist. It's partial agonist because partly it stimulates and partial antagonist because it does not allow the other molecule to come and produce full stimulation. Is that right? Okay, there is another concept, mixed agonist and antagonist. These are the very basic concepts in pharma and you should be crystal clear. What is agonist? Agonist will bind and stimulate fully. Antagonist will bind but no stimulation at all, miserable, antagonist. Partial agonist, antagonist is like a girlfriend in the early time, bind, stimulate a little, but don't allow anyone to come and do full stimulation, right? So what is mixed agonist, antagonist? So when it like uh, binds and stimulates one receptor, but binds and not stimulate another one? Yeah, actually this concept can come from here, that sometimes, like opioid receptor, opioid receptor the multiple sub like mu receptors, kappa receptors or delta receptor they are multiple types. So one receptor may be like this, right, other receptor may be like this. Now what really happens the same drug at one side right it binds it binds as well as it stimulate so it is agonist here but the same drugs goes and bind with another receptor but or for other receptor it does not look same drug goes and bind with another receptor but it is not near to stimulate so this drug a drug a at receptor 1 is binding and stimulating but at receptor 2 it is binding but not stimulating are you understanding that but binding and stimulating binding but not stimulating so same molecule at one side it is agonist and other side it is antagonist so such are called mixed agonist antagonist compounds mixed agonist antagonist compound do you really want another real example? That will be very sad. I don't want to give your example. There's a man, his wife is very angry. Very angry. And she remains his wife very, very angry and not stimulating him. So, right? But having some private time with her ex boyfriend. So she's, what is her antagonist is there? Agonist. So she has a mixed activity, and of course, you don't like it. Right? So that is mixed agonist, antagonist. But it is more true about men, isn't it? Especially when I look at you. <laughs> right, I was just kidding. I know you are not like this. And even if you are, you never tell anyone, I know. <laughs> right, so having said all of this, now I'm going to tell you the adrenergic drugs which bind with the adrenergic receptors. 
I'm going to talk about the drugs which bind with the adrenergic receptors but don't stimulate them. Such drugs will be adrenergic antagonist. Such drugs will be adrenergic antagonist. And of course, they should be classified as sympatholytic drugs, right? So, sympatholytic drugs, some of them are going to block mainly alpha receptors. Let me tell you. Adrenergic receptors antagonist. Alpha, uh, adrenergic receptor antagonist. From where we went to the discussion of agonist antagonist, that antagonists are drugs which will bind with the receptor but won't stimulate and don't let the endogenous epinephrine nor epinephrine to stimulate. Angry wives. Adrenergic receptor antagonist. Now, these drugs, some of them block alpha and some of them block beta receptors, right? And alpha blocker, alpha receptor blocker, some of them block alpha 1 as well as alpha 2. They reduce the activity at alpha 1 and alpha 2. And some of them only block alpha 1, reduce the activity of only alpha 1. Is that right? And of course, there are some which block, yes, beta 1 and beta 2 both. They block both of them. And some of them block only beta 1. Beta 2, pure blocker, we don't use clinically. Right? So, I will not talk about that. So, a drug which will block alpha 1 and alpha 2, it means that is the drug is blocking here as well as blocking here. The example is, yes, phenoxy, phenoxy, benzene, yes and benzene, one drug is phenoxybenzene, other is phentolamine. Pentolamine. These two drugs bind with alpha 1 and alpha 2 receptors and block their activity. So they are alpha blockers. Now, what is the difference between phenoxybenzene and phentolamine? Of course, spellings, what else? What is the difference between phenoxybenzamine and phentolamine? Anyone who has studied some pathologic drugs? No one has studied ever. Oh, phenoxybenzamine is too loving molecule. Once it binds with the receptors, it binds it irreversibly. But phentolamine binds, but with high concentration of epinephrine and norepinephrine, it can be displaced. So the real difference is phenoxybenzamine is irreversible receptor blocker, and phentolamine is reversible receptor blocker. So if someone take a drug which will irreversibly block the receptors. Do you think we will ever recover from the function of that tissue? Answer is yes, because old receptors will be catabolized and eventually new receptors will be synthesized by the tissue if person survives. I think it's a very basic concept. Listen, the drugs which bind the receptors irreversibly, of course, they block the activity for a long time. But actually, the drug which complex with the receptor in a covalent fashion and block the receptor forever, that receptor complex will be eventually catabolized. Receptors are not there forever. In every tissue, most of the receptors are under turnover. Old receptors are being catabolized and new receptors are being synthesized. So actually, when irreversible drug bind with the receptor, or we also call it non-competitive blocker, non-competitive. Because if you bring the competition with high dose of epinephrine or norepinephrine, still this drug will refuse to dissociate from alpha receptor. So it's non-competitive, irreversible blocker of alpha receptor. It will keep on blocking for the life of the alpha receptor, not life of the person. Is that right? Until the new receptors are expressed. For phentolamine, it is a little bit decent. It binds with the alpha receptors, but if a high concentration of agonist come, it can be displaced. So, this can be called competitive blocker. Am I clear? Then there are drugs which mainly block only alpha 1 receptors. Yes, you will tell me. The drugs which block only alpha 1 receptor, at least tell me two names. I don't want 20 names. 
at least tell me prazosen and trazosen oh my god prazo sen and razo sen they are very commonly used as anti hypertensive drugs prazosen is present in mini press anyway prazosen or trazosen they preferably block alpha 1 receptor right prazosen and trazosen very commonly used as anti hypertensive agents these are alpha 1 receptor blockers again i want to know what is the primary difference between prazosen and trazosen what is the basic the single difference you are supposed to know single again tell don't tell me uh, spellings yes what is the basic one difference between prazosen and trazosen which is clinically relevant when you treat your patients prazosen has short half life and trazosen has long half life so here patient has to take maybe three tablets a day here he has to take one tablet a, a day it's a big difference clinically for the patient because when patient take drug three times they feel more sick and feel more inconvenience so prazosin was the original drug and later on they found prazosin which can be given once a day all right am i clear we'll discuss every drug in detail later now we come to beta blockers of course beta blockers are non non selective beta blockers and selective beta blocker non selective block beta 1 and beta 2 both receptors and selective block only beta 1 so you will tell me non selective beta blocker don't tell me many drugs just tell me one drug propranolol excellent everyone should know propranolol it blocks beta 1 and beta 2 both receptors of course there will be big discussion about this drug later because it's very commonly used it has a lot of indication and it has very important contraindication and side effects we'll talk about that later and there are drugs which are beta 1 blockers they are specially used to inhibit the sympathetic activity at heart i don't want many name at least tell me one or two tell me metoprolol atenolol never heard of them meto pro lol or ateno lol so these are the all drugs which bind the adrenergic receptors but they don't stimulate them they are like angry wives right and receptors are blocked even for the endogenous epinephrine nor epinephrine activity any question up to this there is no okay then we come to the drugs okay let's come to the some drugs which are work on this system but stimulate the system of course those will be sympathomimetic let's recap this and then we'll go to sympathomimetic drugs acting on this operators first little bit recap we were talking about sympatholytic drugs sympatholytic drugs can directly block the receptors or they can indirectly by acting on sympathetic nerve ending reduce sympathetic activity right now sympathetic sympatholytic drugs number 1 now you will tell me a drug which reduces synthesis of synthesis of norepinephrine the drug is methyl tyrosine a drug which block the vesicular transport and storage of the neurotransmitter reserpine a drug which basically blocks the release of neurotransmitter one adrenaline britellium and drug which work throughout the mechanism of nerve ending and come out as a pseudo neurotransmitter alpha methyl dopa and then the drug which is sympatholytic drug we directly block the receptors first of all alpha blocker non competitive alpha blocker are which block alpha 1 and alpha 2 both receptors they are phenoxy benzene and phentolamine which is irreversibly binding phenoxy benzamine right and other is reversible binding then alpha 1 blocker purely prazosin and trazosin which has a longer duration of action trazosin then beta blo uh, blocker non selective classical drug propranolol and beta 1 selective blockers metoprolol and 
Atenolol. Remember, these drugs in high concentration also start blocking beta 2. Beta 1 selective blockers are selective only at low doses and low concentrations. If you give atenolol or metoprolol in very high concentration, they start blocking the beta 2 also, right? Now, then we come to, okay, let's have a break and then we'll continue. Right, now on the same neuroaffector operators, we will discuss sympathomimetic drugs. The drugs which increase the sympathetic activity. You know, there are two ways to increase the sympathetic activity. Number one is, some drugs go directly to the receptors on the post-synaptic surface or on the effector tissue and drugs directly stimulate the receptors. If a group of drug is directly stimulating the receptors, right, we call them direct sympathomimetic drugs. Sympathomimetic drugs, okay, let's classify them here. Sympathomimetic drugs. As a broad category, these drugs produce the pharmacological actions which mimic to the physiological actions of sympathetic nervous system, right? Now, these sympathomimetic drugs are direct acting and indirectly acting, direct acting and indirectly acting sympathomimetic drugs, right? Direct acting means the drugs which directly stimulate the adrenergic receptors. Drugs which directly stimulate the adrenergic receptors. These are adrenergic receptors agonist. And indirectly acting sympathomimetic drugs are those drugs which act on the nerve ending, sympathetic nerve ending, right? And alter the function of the sympathetic nerve ending, right, in such a way that amount of norepinephrine released by the nerve ending is more or amount of norepinephrine present in synaptic area is more than normal. I will explain what are these drugs and how do they work. So what are indirectly sympathomimetic drugs? Indirectly sympathomimetic drugs do not work directly on the receptor on the post synaptic surface. They work on sympathetic nerve ending and alter some act function here to keep or release more norepinephrine or neurotransmitter in the synaptic cleft. And of course when there is more neurotransmitter here, it will act on the receptor in a more intensity. So this, such drugs are called indirectly acting drugs. You want to learn about directly acting drugs first or indirectly acting? Direct action first, that is easy, right? Directly acting drugs are, which will stimulate these receptors directly. For example, this alpha-1 stimulant drug, alpha-1 and agonist or there are alpha-1 and alpha-2 agonist, 2 agonist, there are some drugs which are alpha-1 stimulant beta 1 stimulant and beta 2 stimulant. Then there are drugs which are beta 1 and beta 2 stimulant. There are drugs which are mainly beta 2 stimulant. There are some drugs which will mainly block, uh, stimulate alpha 1 receptor. There are some drugs which will stimulate alpha 1 and alpha 2. Okay, rather we should put here little bit change. Look here. Drugs which mainly stimulate only alpha 1 receptor, drugs which mainly stimulate only alpha 2 receptors and drugs which stimulate alpha 1 receptor, beta 1 receptor and beta 2 receptors, drugs which stimulate mainly beta 1 and beta 2 and there are drugs which stimulate mainly beta 1 and drugs which stimulate mainly 
beta 2 how many categories 1 2 3 4 5 and 6 categories is that right let's move step by step first of all the drug which will stimulate alpha 1 okay I will remove this area and compare and contrast them the drug will stimulate only alpha 1 receptor they are mainly alpha 1 receptor they bind with the alpha 1 receptor and stimulate here right who will tell me the name of such drugs phenyl Ephrine. Have you heard of phenyl ephrine? So, phenyl ephrine is the drug, is mainly alpha 1 stimulant. Is that right? Phenyl ephrine. Then we go to the next drug, which mainly stimulate alpha 2. This is alpha 1 stimulant. Now we come to drug which alpha 2 stimulant. Now it is very interesting to look at it. That if there is a drug which is alpha 2 stimulant, it will stimulate here. It has stimulatory action on alpha 2. You know what will happen? It is sympathomimetic or sympatholytic. Use your own head. If a drug is stimulating here, it means it is giving the message to the nerve ending. There is lot of neurotransmitter here nerve ending will be inhibited and release of neurotransmitter will be less. So, this is an unusual exception that a drug which act on presynaptic alpha 2 receptors and stimulate them too much, it is giving message to the nerve ending there is lot of norepinephrine here and actually norepinephrine release will be less and it will become sympatholytic. This is a very tricky, tricky situation. Are you understanding me? Anyone who could not understand? Right? So, drugs which stimulate alpha 2 receptors, basically they inhibit the neurotransmitter release. It's an unusual situation. But if there is a drug which block this, which block this, right? It is a blocker. If drug can block alpha 2 receptors, it means nerve ending is releasing the neurotransmitter, but it is itself blind, it is totally blind to the amount of neurotransmitter present here. Because when this receptor is blocked, whatever norepinephrine is released, can it stimulate this receptor? No. When this receptor is not stimulated, nerve ending receives the message that probably there is no neurotransmitter there. So, nerve ending will start releasing more neurotransmitter. Are you understanding? So, it is a very unusual situation when you talk about the alpha 2 receptor stimulant and blocker. Right? Alpha 2 receptor on presynaptic nerve ending are the eyes of the nerve ending by which they look at the amount of neurotransmitter at the synaptic cleft. This is synaptic cleft neurotransmitter sensor for the auto inhibition. When you have a drug which stimulate alpha 2 receptors, right, then nerve ending stop releasing the neurotransmitter. But if you have a drug which inhibits the alpha 2 receptors, drug which inhibits the alpha 2 receptor, nerve ending will no more inhibited and it will release excessive amount of norepinephrine. Now, can you tell me some drug which can stimulate alpha 2 receptors? Please tell me, a drug which can stimulate alpha 2 receptor and nerve ending will be too much inhibited and it will not release neurotransmitter. The drug is, you know it, you know it, I can bet it you know it. Drug is clonidine. Have you heard of clonidine? Clonidine in central nervous system at vasomotor center in medulla. It binds with alpha 2 receptors and stimulates them. It stimulates them. And nerve ending the fool, they think they have released too much norepinephrine. They stop releasing the norepinephrine. So, vasomotor center is inhibited. When vasomotor center is inhibited, then from medulla down going sympathetic flow and vasomotor sympathetic outflow all is inhibited. And blood vessels dilate and blood pressure goes down. So, such drugs 
which are alpha 2 stimulant are antihypertensive like clonidine. Clonidine, okay. Here I am saying alpha 2 stimulant that is clonidine. But remember, this is not sympathomimetic, this is an unusual sympatho. Central sympatholytic, central, central mean in the central nervous system, sympatholytic, clonidine, this is unusual situation, the receptor is stimulated, but it inhibits the nerve ending, the release of norepinephrine become less and vasomotor system is inhibited and blood pressure goes down. Is that right? There are two central there are two important central antihypertensive drug. One is clonidine, right, which stimulate alpha 2 receptors, inhibit the nerve endings of sympathetic nervous nerve ending of noradrenergic system in vasomotor center, vasomotor center is inhibited. Other centrally acting drug is centrally acting antihypertensive drug is alpha methyl dopa. That also work on the vasomotor center, but in a different way. Alpha methyl dopa, as I told you, will be taken up by the system and released as pseudo neurotransmitter and again neurotransmission fails. So clonidine reduces the discharge of normal norepinephrine from the nerve ending but alpha methyl dopa lead to the release of pseudo neurotransmitter and reduce synthesis of original neurotransmitter. Am I clear? So alpha 1 stimulant is sympathomimetic but alpha 2 stimulant is, stimulant is sympatho Latex, this is very unusual point. Then we come to a drug which can stimulate alpha 1, also stimulate, okay, I will talk about beta 1, but very little action on beta 2. What is this drug? It has now not, first drug was having action only on alpha 1, phenylephrine. Now we have a drug which has alpha 1 action and beta 1 action, but not beta 2. What is the drug? Please tell me, please tell me, norepinephrine, which we are studying from last two hours. The very speciality of norepinephrine is it stimulates alpha 1 and beta 1, but does not stimulate beta 2 significantly. Right? Norepinephrine. Am I clear, really? Okay, go one more step. Come to another drug, which will stimulate alpha 1, beta 1. And now we have a drug which also stimulates beta 2, right? Alpha 1, beta 1 and beta 2, all of them are stimulated. What is the name of this drug? Yes, ma'am. Excellent. It is epinephrine. So, my dear students, the real difference in norepinephrine and epinephrine is norepinephrine has alpha 1, beta 1 action but less beta 2. Epinephrine is really balanced. It stimulates alpha 1, beta 1 and beta 2, all of them. If you really know receptor distribution in the body, by this simple thing you can tell the action of the drug. Of course, norepinephrine does not have beta 2 actions and epinephrine does have. For example, beta 2 action is bronchodilation. Norepinephrine will not do bronchodilation, epinephrine will. Beta 2 action on the liver is glycogenolysis, right? So this will not do glycogenolysis, but epinephrine will do glycogenolysis and we'll talk these things later. Let's move forward. Now, funny thing, another drug which does not have alpha 1 action, but has mainly beta 1 and beta 2 action. Look at it. We started the drugs with main alpha 1 action, full alpha 1 action. Then we came to drug which has alpha 1 and beta 1 action to the drug which has alpha 1, beta 1 and beta 2 action. Now we are reducing the action of alpha 1. We are left with which actions? Mainly beta 1 and beta 2. What is the name of the drug? Which is mainly stimulating beta 1 and beta 2. I am about to be impressed by that lady. Okay, this young man. Excellent. Isoproterinol. Very good. Isoproterinol. You know, it's so easy now. If you know the beta 1, beta 2 action in the body, these are the actions of isoproterinol. But if you add alpha 1 action to this, you get epinephrine. And if you have alpha 1, beta 1 action and reduce the action of beta 2, you have action of norepinephrine. 
Is it difficult? I don't know why it is so easy. Okay, now we come to a little more thing. We come to drug which is mainly beta 1 action and then of course drug which is mainly beta 2 action. Actually we have a drug which has in a very high doses, supraphysiological doses, there is a neurotransmitter or hormone which has beta 1 action. But if dose become very high, then it start alpha 1 action also. It has little alpha 1 action, but in very high doses it will start alpha 1 action. Yeah, and it has dopamine receptor action also. This is a drug which stimulate dopamine receptors. It can also stimulate beta 1 receptors and in very high concentration can stimulate alpha 1 action. What is the name of the drug? Dopamine, very good. Dopamine. So dopamine can stimulate beta 1 receptors in the heart and increase cardiac output. And dopamine at the same time can act on dopamine receptor on renal vessels and dilate them. Let me tell you this tricky thing, listen. If a patient comes to you who is undergoing severe reduction in cardiac failure, very less cardiac failure and due to reduced cardiac failure, there is so little, you know, blood flow to the kidney that you are about to have acute tubular necrosis. You know, when there is severe ischemia to the kidney, you are going to have acute tubular necrosis, renal shutdown. So if you have a patient with cardiac failure and associated risk of what? Renal shutdown due to reduce renal blood flow, you have to do two things. You have to stimulate the heart and you have to dilate the renal vessels simultaneously. And we have a double action drug which has beta 1 action on the heart and dopamine receptor stimulation on the renal vessel and you will protect, increase the cardiac output and that drug will be renoprotective as well. Protect the kidney from acute tubular necrosis. The drug is dopamine. dopamine. That is why in very severe shocks when cardiac output is down, we give infusion of dopamine that it should stimulate the cardiac output and keep the renal vessels dilated. Is that right? But you have to be very careful. Every good thing does not remain good under all circumstances. If unfortunately you give excessive dose of dopamine at very high concentration it starts stimulating alpha 1 receptor and when alpha 1 receptors are stimulated in the renal vessel they will again shut down. So what happens? You have to give moderate doses and take very good care that infusion rate is well controlled. You will study when I will teach you dopamine that dopamine has very good dopamine receptor stimulation at 2 microgram. I should not go into detail of that right now. Just trust me. At very low doses, dopamine stimulate what? Dopamine receptors and dilate the renal vessels. In moderate doses, beta 1 action start and also become cardio stimulant. At very high doses, unfortunately start stimulating alpha 1 receptors and that may lead to again renal vessel constriction. Is that right? Any question up to this? No? But if you have another patient who has no problem of renal vasoconstriction, only cardiac output is down. If you want to give a drug to a person to stimulate his heart, you want to stimulate his heart, increase cardiac output, but you don't want renal dilation, you don't want renal dilation because there is not so much shock that person is going into acute tubular necrosis, then dopamine is not the drug of choice. You want a drug which mainly work only on beta 1 receptor, you want a drug which mainly work on, okay I will put it here, drug which mainly work on beta 1 stimulant and not stimulating the dopamine receptor. What is the name of the drug? Again listen, there are two patients with reduced cardiac output. In one patient, you need to stimulate the heart and dilate the renal vessels to protect the kidney from acute tubular necrosis. The choice of drug is dopamine. Another patient, he has reduced cardiac output. You want to keep the heart a little bit stimulated, but there's no problem with the kidney. Such, such patients are classically like heart transplant patient. 
when the heart is transplanted, you give some support, stimulant to the heart, so that in new environment it keep on working. Is that right? Very good. Dr. Rose has told us this drug is Dobutamine. We'll study all these things in detail, but right now you only remember that dopamine is cardio stimulant and reno dilator, reno vessel dilator, but dobutamine is mainly cardio stimulant. Am I clear? There's no problem. And then we come to a very important group of drugs which are mainly beta 2 stimulant. Yes, who will tell me? Drugs which are beta 2 stimulant. Yes, yeah, salbutamol, albuterol, ritodrine. This is a very commonly used for, especially salbutamol, albuterol, all these drugs are used as bronchodilators. Right, so I put it here. Salbutamol. So all of these drugs are sympathomimetic because they increase some of the function of sympathetic nervous system in the body. Right, but because all of these drugs are working on the receptors, so we can call them directly acting sympathomimetic drug. Only one exception was alpha 2 stimulant, which was indirectly acting sympatholytic. In this whole story, right, remember clonidine was not sympathomimetic, it is sympatholytic, even though it stimulates the adrenergic receptor. Am I really clear? Anyone who is confused, raise your hand. No one is confused. Okay. Now we come to the drugs which really work on presynaptic nerve ending and increase the sympathetic action. Right? For that purpose, first of all, I will tell you a drug, right, which works here on this reuptake mechanism. And this drug, which what it is doing? This drug is what this drug is doing? It is blocking the reuptake mechanism. Now what will happen? You are yourself intelligent. That can it go in? No. So it will be staying here. A drug which bind with reuptake one mechanism, right? And whatever neurotransmitter is released. The recapture of or reuptake of neurotransmitters is reduced, so neurotransmitter stays here longer in higher concentration and it really works more. So what we have done? We have got stimulation of the receptors indirectly. So we call it indirect sympathomimetic drug. Can you tell me the name of this drug? Yeah. Okay, remove the tail and put the name. What's the name of this drug? Pardon? Of course, he's so intelligent, he tells me it is reuptake inhibitors. He's right, these are reuptake inhibitors. I want the name of the drug. Yeah. Her toxins, I think this is something all of you must know. Have you heard of something called cocaine? Of course, it's drug but illicit drug. What cocaine does? When you take cocaine, you become hyper stimulated. You must be knowing Gavin, right? <laughs> so, don't laugh at him. He never told me, right? So what happens when you take cocaine, cocaine goes and binds with the sympathetic nerve endings and block the reuptake. So whatever normal amount of norepinephrine is released, it stays there and stimulates in central nervous system because cocaine is lipid soluble, goes into central nervous system, yeah. right? And sympathetic drive is more and you feel hyper stimulated and excited. Some people like situations like this, right? But cocaine does it with very strong cocaine. But there are some drugs also we use. I mean, there are drugs. They also bind it with very, and slow down this reuptake. They little bit block this reuptake mechanism, but little bit. So that concentration of norepinephrine remains in this area, little bit high, right? Those drugs bind with these reuptake mechanism at dopaminergic neurons, at noradrenergic neurons, at adrenergic neurons. So multiple 
neurotransmitters in central nervous system their concentration is increased in synapses what is the group of that drug called yeah no all of you know that all of you know that have you heard of tricyclic antidepressants this is what tricyclic antidepressants are doing tricyclic antidepressants tricyclic antidepressants what they are doing they bind with reuptake 1 but not as strongly as cocaine because they are not cocaines right they bind it mildly and they slightly reduce the reuptake and they keep on increasing the concentration of these excitatory neuron in the central nervous system synapses so that you come out of depression is that right we'll talk their actions in detail when i teach you tricyclic antidepressants of course there will be time for that also one day any question up to this and i think it's very important to tell at this stage have you heard of the drug prozac ssris what is that ssris ssris yes selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors classical example is prozac what prozac is doing i think uh, what is the active drug in the prozac uh, no that is paroxetin is related with that fluoxetin fluoxetin what is the drug in prozac fluoxetin okay yeah paxil has fluoxetin and fluoxetin so fluoxetin or paroxetin or related drug they are also reuptake inhibitors but they selectively block reuptake mechanisms only on serotonergic neurons so that, that is why they are given selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors because tricyclic antidepressants are non selective they inhibit the reuptake of epinephrine, they inhibit the reuptake of norepinephrine, they inhibit the reuptake of dopamine. Am I clear? So, tricyclic antidepressant act on the reuptake mechanisms in central nervous system and don't allow the released neurotransmitter to be reuptaken. Concentration of adrenergic neurotransmitters and synaptic area become more and there is more action on the adrenergic receptors am i clear right and there is another way to increase the release you know how okay let me tell you you put you block this cat mau right you put a drug right and this is like a basket and this is trapped now when norepinephrine is coming back can it be destroyed by this so it will be accumulated here and effectively reuptaken into vesicle so vesi all the norepinephrine which is coming normally a part of it is destroyed by mau and part of it is restored stored again into vesicle but if drug blocks monomine oxidase system then whatever is reuptaken if of course this drug is not there whatever is reuptaken right that will be all of it will be stored there and st store the neurotransmitters store in the vesicles will be very high so with every action potential extra amount of the drug uh, neurotransmitter is released and it become a sort of sympathomimetic action to mild degree what is the drug here yeah these are also antidepressant drugs because they increase neurotransmitter concentration here yeah who is going to tell me what is the drug here anyone this drug is number one pargyl i don't know from where they find this name pargylin p a r g y l i n e how you will read it pargylin pargylin and other drug is prenyl cypromin Renyl cypromin. These are also monomine oxidase inhibitors and they are also used as antidepressants. Again, we will discuss into detail when I will teach you antidepressants.
right so one way to increase neurotransmitter here is don't allow the reuptake other is allow the reuptake but don't allow intraneuronal destruction so everything will be stored over there right and the last group of the drugs which facilitate binding of vesicle with this membrane so they release they increase the release of neurotransmitters there is another group of drug which can enter into the sympathetic nerve endings and help and accelerate the fusion of vesicles with the nerve membrane and release neurotransmitter more efficiently right so what is this drug now now i think you must answer there are drugs which go into central nervous system bind with sympathetic nerve endings or we can say adrenergic and noradrenergic and dopaminergic nerve endings and lead to excessive release of these neurotransmitter name of the drug is which will stimulate you a little bit yes you know it your all friends may be taking it near the exams amphetamines you never heard of it amphetamines right these are amphetamines amphetamines right these are also increasing the release of adrenergic neurotransmitters in central nervous system and also with amphetamine the other drug is tyramine tyra mean please don't confuse tyramine with tyrosine and don't confuse tyramine with alpha methyl tyrosine right alpha methyl tyrosine inhibit the or tyrosine hydroxylase and reduces sympathetic activity but tyramine uh, help the vesicle to fuse more efficiently with the membrane and increase sympathetic activity that's all for today do you have any question no question uh, you are talking about labetalol that is a very unusual drug that is alpha blocker as well as beta blocker we'll talk about it when we'll discuss into detail sympatholytic drugs it was just a very brief introduction to put some basic concepts in your mind We'll talk about libitolol that is alpha blocker as well as beta 1 blocker plus libitolol has one more action we'll discuss it activate the potassium channels let the potassium leak out of the myocardial cell and reduce their resting membrane potential we'll talk about these things later right any more now today we are going to talk about the distribution of different types of adrenergic receptors on body tissues right as you must be knowing already that some tissues have alpha 1 receptors some tissues have beta 1 adrenergic receptors right and we have to see that why different tissues in the body have different type of adrenergic receptors right we were talking last time that uh, Mr. Gavin was followed by a big black dark dog, right? And we, we have already discussed that his central nervous system was activated and there was heavy sympathetic outflow. And that sympathetic outflow was releasing norepinephrine from the nerve endings to multiple tissues and adrenal medulla was releasing epinephrine in general circulation. So when Mr. Gavin was under stress of that dog, right his biological system was under the influence of norepinephrine and epinephrine now when epinephrine and norepinephrine will act on different tissues on the body and work on the different organs on the body they should modify the performance and function of the different tissues in such a way that those organs and tissue which help to fight the stress those organs should be stimulated and those organs which do not help to fight with the stress right uh, those organs should be inhibited for example dog is after you you are running on the road now heart 
can help you by increasing cardiac output. So heart should be stimulated. Opposite to that, GIT at that very moment, that is the n not the time to digest the chicken piece you ate one hour back. You have to save, you have to save your own leg piece, isn't it? So GIT acti activity should be increased or decreased? Decreased. So by this example, what I'm saying, when we are under stress and sympathetic nervous system is firing, a lot of norepinephrine and epinephrine is being released in our biological system. Epinephrine and norepinephrine is going to work on multiple tissues through adrenergic receptors. And adrenergic receptors should alter the uh, body, organs and tissue system function in such a way that those organs which help to fight the stress, they should be stimulated. And those organs which do not help you to fight the stress or flight from the stress, those organs and tissues should be inhibited. So we can say that biological response to sympathetic stimulation, right? We say biological response, biological response to stress, right? Under, yes please, under sympathetic sympathetic activation, sympathetic nervous system is activated. What should be the biological response to the stress under sympathetic nervous system activation? Sympathetic nervous system should sympathize with you, activate the tissues which can help you to fight the stress and inhibit the tissues which do not help you to fight the stress. So it means all biological responses can be divided into basically two part, right? That tissues to be stimulated, tissues and organs to be stimulated. Tissues and organs stimulated, right? Right, and of course, there must be tissues and organs inhibited. Tissues and organ function inhibited, right? Of course, the tissues and organs which are stimulated are those organs which are going to fight your stress. And tissues and organs functions which are inhibited are those tissues which don't help you to fight with the stress, right? As we have discussed, heart should be stimulated. Is that right? So that cardiac output should be more and you should provide more blood going to the muscles so that you can really run away from the danger or fight with the danger. Opposite to that, as I told you, gastrointestinal system at that very moment when you are under extreme stress should be inhibited, right? You can digest the, digest, absorb the GIT contents later on. First you save your life. Is that right? Now, how it is mediated? Why some tissues are stimulated, how some tissues are stimulated and other tissues are inhibited? This is a very interesting question. The same neurotransmitter and hormone are stimulating one tissue and inhibiting other tissue. Answer is very simple. Neurotransmitter is same on these tissues and that tissue. But these tissues have stimulatory receptors and those tissues have inhibitory receptors. That is so simple. We don't need to be too clever for this thing. It's very easy to understand that in these tissues, there should be receptors which are stimulatory. They are adrenergic receptor, the macromolecule which responds to epinephrine and norepinephrine, but they produce stimulation of the tissue. And here should be such adrenergic receptors that when, once they're activated, they are actually leading to inhibition of the tissue. Now it's so simple again. How? All the receptors, which are stimulatory, they are number one. For example, adrenergic receptor, alpha-1 adrenergic receptor, they are stimulatory, right? Beta-1 adrenergic receptors are stimulatory. And when we talk about alpha-2 adrenergic receptor, these are, look, these are generalizations. There are few exceptions, but first learn the general, general principles. Alpha-2 adrenergic receptors, 
they are inhibitory to the tissues. Beta 2 adrenergic receptors, they are mostly inhibited to, they are inhibitory to certain biological activities in the body. So same epinephrine which will go to one tissue, act on alpha 1 and stimulate that tissue. And same epinephrine go to another tissue having beta 2 adrenergic receptor and tissue will be inhibited. Let me give you classical example. Let's suppose this is your circulatory system, right? And here is a blood vessel which is going to the kidney. And here is a blood vessel, let's suppose, which is going to the muscle. <coughs> it's going to the skeletal muscle. Now listen carefully. When dog is after you, you are under stress. Blood flow to muscle should be increased. Blood flow to muscle should be increased. So increase blood flow. So epinephrine and norepinephrine or catecholamines should increase the blood flow to skeletal muscle so that you can run away from the dog or you can fight with the dog, whatever you choose to do, right? But blood flow to kidney should be increased or decreased? Increased. Yeah? Decreased. I think he thinks increased. Right? Blood flow to kidney should be decreased because renal blood vessels should constrict so that blood should be diverted to more important area because if you dilate the kidney blood vessel, last time a student was telling that blood vessels to kidney should also dilate. I ask a simple question. Do you think you are going to urinate on the dog? <laughs> that is not a good way to fight. That involves a big risk, isn't it? Actually, that is the not time to make the urine and things like that. Right? You can do it later. That is the time to constrict the renal blood vessels, save the blood and divert it to the dilated blood vessels going to the muscle. So, blood flow should be decreased, blood flow to the renal side. Am I clear? Now, question is how the same neurotransmitter is dilating one blood vessel and how the same neurotransmitter is constricting the other blood vessel. Is that right? We'll talk about the tone of vasomotor tone in this area and vasomotor tone in this area. Uh, let me disconnect this vessel. I remove this vessel, vessel from the skeletal muscle and bring it down. This is a blood vessel from the skeletal muscle. And let's suppose I make a section of it. This is the blood vessel from the skeletal muscle and these are its smooth you know blood vessels have in their media, what are these? Smooth muscles, is that right? Now there are smooth muscles in the blood vessel going to the skeletal muscle and of course let's study this blood vessel also. What is this blood vessel? Yes, renal blood vessel and of course there are smooth muscles here also present, am I right? Now, the concept which we have to develop is that under the same influence of the same neurotransmitter, why the renal blood vessels constrict and why skeletal muscles blood vessels, yes, dilate, right? Because if we take a container, if we take a container and dip these blood vessels into this container and this container is having a fluid rich in epinephrine and norepinephrine. Epinephrine, yes, and norepinephrine. Now, there's a lot of epinephrine and norepinephrine into this fluid. Both blood vessels are dipped into that. This blood vessel should, what? Constrict and this should dilate. To constrict the, this blood vessel, the smooth muscles of this blood vessel should be stimulated or inhibited. You have to stimulate the smooth muscles here because when you stimulate these smooth muscles, they will constrict, right? So it means that this, this smooth muscle, I remove one smooth muscle from here, this smooth muscle of this blood vessel, this should be stimulated so that the blood vessel should constrict. 
right opposite to that the smooth muscle here the smooth muscle i show one smooth muscle big smooth muscle here uh, in the skeletal muscle blood vessel right it should relax because when these smooth muscles will relax they get inhibited they will open up the vessel and more blood flow will come to the muscle so it means there should be stimulatory receptor here and there should be inhibitory receptor here so the stimulatory receptor here should be alpha 1 adrenergic receptor there should be yes alpha 1 adrenergic receptor when epinephrine will bind with alpha 1 adrenergic receptor there will be stimulatory signal and these smooth muscles will constrict and blood flow to kidney will be reduced opposite to that this smooth muscle which is from the skeletal muscle blood vessel right we want this should relax so this smooth muscle should have stimulatory receptor or inhibitory receptor and inhibitory receptor from this group it has the beta 2 it has the beta 2 receptors so what really happens that when epinephrine epinephrine work on the alpha 1 receptor on blood vessel smooth muscle blood vessels constrict when epinephrine work on the beta 2 recept adrenergic receptors on the smooth muscle the blood vessels blood vessels dilate. dilate this is how the one neurotransmitter right epinephrine and norepinephrine right or other catecholamines by acting on alpha 1 receptor they are producing vasoconstriction of renal vessel because smooth muscle then yes smooth muscle and renal vasculature are stimulated and they constrict opposite to that there are beta 2 receptors present on skeletal muscle vasculature right so when epinephrine and norepinephrine uh, work on the beta 2 receptor especially epinephrine when it work on the beta 2 receptors on the smooth muscle of blood vessel blood vessels dilate so this is a very simple example now what i was saying the hair smooth muscle will constrict and that will help the biological system and their smooth muscle should relax and dilate that will help the biological system under stress so the tissues tissue mean hair smooth muscle so smooth muscle here should be stimulated and there should be <coughs> inhibited i hope it makes some sense now we'll apply the same principle all over the body from head to toe that how logically receptors should be distributed on different tissues later on it will become so easy that if i say drug has mainly alpha 1 action you can logically think which tissues have alpha 1 action and what are the pharmacological actions if i say later on that drug has beta 2 actions you automatically think which tissues logically should have beta 2 receptors and then you can infer the pharmacological actions so let's complete this thing come back all the tissues and organ which help to fight the stress should be stimulated and they should have stimulatory receptor alpha 1 or beta 1 all the tissues which do not help to fight with the stress should be inhibited right and they should have inhibitory adrenergic receptors alpha 2 or beta 2 is that right now after that we will make a general statement here right one general statement the general statement here which we are going to make is that all the tissues all the tissues to be stimulated now this is what you have to understand very clearly stimulated have alpha 1 adrenergic receptors except except which tissues all the tissues to be stimulated have alpha 1 adrenergic receptor except number one heart number two in the kidney juxta glomerular apparatus and what is this cell adipocyte now listen carefully what i really mean by this 
all the tissues to be stimulated should have alpha 1 receptor except heart juxta glomerular apparatus in the kidney and adipocyte fat cells these are having not alpha 1 they are having beta 1 so these tissues will have which receptors heart should have beta 1 receptors kidney juxta glomerular apparatus juxta yes juxta glomerular apparatus should have beta 1 and adipocyte should have beta 1 now listen actually adipocytes have beta 3 beta 3 receptors are modified beta 1 that is why we can put it with beta 1 beta 3 receptors are on the fat cells or adipocyte they are modified yes they are modified beta 1 so listen again when sympathetic nervous system fires in my body if I say 20 tissues are stimulated all of them will have alpha 1 receptor except these three tissues which are beta 1 am I clear now we go to another general principle right and that principle is that all the tissue to be inhibited all the tissue to be inhibited should have yes should have beta 2 adrenergic receptor except following which have alpha 2 except presynaptic nerve endings yes except presynaptic nerve ending which have alpha 2 adrenergic receptor plus platelets platelets which have alpha 2 receptors plus insulin producing cells which are insulin producing cells insulin producing cells these are beta cells of pancreas but they have alpha 2 they have alpha 2 do you think in stress you need more insulin or less insulin oh my god my friend is saying that there should be more insulin so what happened dog bark at you lot of insulin come glucose go into cell you develop hypoglycemia and you become like this in front of dog it's not a very good approach isn't it because you need lot of in stressful circumstances you need your brain to work and brain needs oxygen oh, of course with oxygen brain needs lot of glucose and to keep the glucose supply to the brain you have to keep the blood glucose level high and for that purpose you should release more glucose from the liver and you should not release insulin and insulin should not push the glucose into cells peripheral cells am i right so it's very logical that when you are under stress you need more glucose for the brain right do you need to release massive amount of insulin no so insulin releasing cells should be stimulated or inhibited inhibited so naturally they will have which cells which receptors inhibitory receptors what receptors are now choice alpha 2 or beta 2 but I said in this general rule all the tissues to be inhibited have beta 2 receptors except these three so it should have alpha 2 I hope this is making some sense up to now right now start studying the real tragedy which is going on dog after you and okay here you are right I will not put anything here and this is the dog after you and look his tail aggressive he is very happy he caught you he's about to catch you I think it should be in action also I don't know how to make dog in action but anyway so it's rapidly oh. coming to you. right it's coming to you right now we have to see from here up to here what are the changes in your body is that right by under the influence of adrenergic system right now we start from the top what about your hair under stress what should happen to your hair I'm not talking about my hair yes they stand up why 
how they can why hair should stand up and how they can help you to fight with the stress yeah actually you know what happened it's a lower animal response we have evolved from lower animals you know even though we think uh, other things right uh, in the lower animals you have seen when uh, uh, those cocks fight the husbands of the hens when they fight what they do they make their hair like this what they are doing they are trying to increase their apparent side and scare the other enemy so under stress in jungle life there are two types of stress number one you are fighting with other animals so your hair should stand up right and you try to apparently increase your size and scare the other animal and secondly another stress is usually very cold weather right so the hair should stand up and air should be trapped and some temperature isolation so what really happens under stress hair stand up still is that right so again under the stress hair should stand up and you know that if this is a skin here is your what is this hair follicle and here is your beautiful hair right now there is a muscle here we call it erector pili this muscle should be stimulated or inhibited it should be stimulated to erect the hair it should be stimulated can you tell me which receptor should be there alpha 1 there's no need to memorize the things make the sense out of it so here are alpha 1 adrenergic receptors am i clear now we come down of course under the hair but i'm always uh, sometimes i cannot understand some women make their hair like straight up i don't know what they are either they are doing it to scare someone or it's <laughs> attitude attitude to uh, self protection right but someone should guide them that they may scare some good things okay so after that here we come down right if you come down there are eyes now in the eyes there should be some changes which you which should help you to fight with the stress so let's talk about eyeball and what happens to the structures in eye to under stressful circumstances and how your energetic system is operating first of all about the pupil of the eye pupil should constrict or dilate dilate what is the advantage of dilating the pupil actually jungle environment the real stress is when someone attacks you in darkness right so evolution in evolution the response has been maintained that when you are under stress in a dark environment right uh, pupil should dilate so that you can absorb more and more light and you can see more clearly for this purpose let's draw your beautiful eye here and there are two types of muscles here these are dilator pupillae you know it these are radial muscles these are dilator pupillae and here you have yes what are these smooth muscles which are circular these are of course it is not ciliaris how you will study pharmacology if you put ciliaris here i will tell you later what is this constrictor pupillae before you tell me something else these green muscles are constrictor pupillae so there is dilator pupillae and there are constrictor pupillae right now under stress pupil should constrict or dilate yes it should dilate right and if pupil should dilate yes if pupil should dilate then this dilator pupillae muscle the radial muscle dilator pupillae muscle should be inhibited or stimulated it should be stimulated because of this red dilator pupillae if it is stimulated it will pull the pupil out open right so on this on the dilator pupillae the receptor should be stimulatory or inhibitory stimulatory which receptor should be there alpha 1 is that right so no need to memorize again so there are alpha 1 adrenergic receptor present on dilator oh sorry dilator pupillae and when dilator pupillae are stimulated pupil will dilate is that right pupil will dilate there is some interesting physiological phenomena related with pupil dilate dilation 
Uh, do you know that uh, sometimes some clever woman, intelligent woman, they put some substances to keep their pupil dilated? Why? You know, in models also. You know this thing or not? Not interested in models. Right. Why they keep, keep, try to keep their pupil dilated? Another question. Why women like candlelight dinner? Why it is romantic? Yes, it is romantic, but why? Every woman knows so good to have dinner with someone in candlelight. But why candlelight? Why not under flashlight dinner? <laughs> yeah, because pupil dilate. It means dilation of pupil has something to do with romance. Isn't it? Right. Now, he says so that pupil looks bigger. But what it will give a message to you if your girl has a dilated pupil? What message will come to you? Let me tell you, let me tell you. Men are visual, right? Men are stimulated by the visual stimuli coming from the female, right? That is why they work so hard on makeup and other things. Now, what really happens that during ejaculation or during orgasm, parasympathetic nervous system fire or sympathetic fires? It's Dr. Roth is saying parasympathetic, you will kill the man. You know, listen, parasympathetic, erection, parasympathetic activity in male is erection and female it is secretions, right? It is sympathetic activity. The real sexual act is parasympathetic activity followed by intense sympathetic outflow. Erection in the male is parasympathetic. Female gets wet, it is parasympathetic. When there is intense sympathetic stimulation, male gets ejaculation, female gets orgasm. Of course, at that time, pupil dilate. Is that right? Now you can make some sense, right? And in ancient times, some women were so much desperate to impress the ma males that they are so much interested in the male and their pupils are dilated. They were put, putting in their eyes Atropa Belladonna. You know Atropa Belladonna? That will dilate the pupil. But the mechanism of Atropa Belladonna will discuss in some other lecture, right? That dilates the pupil. So what women do? They put the drops of Atropa Belladonna there, right? And that is why Belladonna mean beautiful woman. Beautiful woman was using Atropa. A trop of belladonna, a trop of a beautiful woman, right? So this is a very common thing that women, when they are going to see their male whom they love, they put some a trop of belladonna there, and people will dilate, and male will feel somewhere in their message coming to their unconscious mind that she is so much uh, happy with me, right? And the real situation is this: that after putting a trop of belladonna, ciliaris muscle is paralyzed and male looks very blurred. <laughs> I don't know, that may help some women to tolerate the situation, right? Am I clear to you? No problem into this, right? So, let's come back. So, dilated pupil for the candlelight is a good thing. Dilated pupil for model women who model for the fashion shows, they put something to dilate, that is good, right? So, what I want you to remember that sympathetic nervous system dilates the pupil, right? In darkness, in stress, and even at intense sexual experience. Now let's move forward. And even in fear, people dilate. You know, intense fear, people dilate. Now we move forward. What about ciliaris muscle? What happens to ciliaris when you are under intense stress? Dog is after you. Is that right? Dog is after you, you are under intense stress. Sympathetic nervous system is firing. Not only pupil should dilate, but there should be one more change in the eyeball. The next change in the eyeball is that you will, you are supposed to focus the lens for near VN or far VN. When you are under stress, you want to run away. You should focus for near VN or far VN. Far VN. Is that right? So under stress and sympathetic overflow, lens should be, lens of the eye should be accommodating for far VN. So lens should be thin, should be thick, globular or thin. Lens should be 
globular or lens should be in A position or lens should be in B position. It should be like this for far VN because if lens become globular, if lens become globular, then it is focused for near VN. If lens become flattened, it is focused for far VN. So it means sympathetic nervous system, intense stimulation should focus the eyes for far VN so that you can really look far and run away, where to run away, right? But the thing is that how it really happens, how lens is flattened, this is the function of ciliaris muscle. So let me tell you, where is ciliaris? So next time you don't say that constrictor pupilla is ciliaris. So you should know where is ciliaris and how the ciliaris work, right? So let me draw a diagram here. This is your eyeball and here is your beautiful cornea, right? And here is your pupil, your pupil here. Now, you already know that muscle here is constrictor pupillae. Please don't confuse this with ciliaris. Ciliaris muscle is present over here. Ciliaris muscle is present over here. Now, this is your lens. Here is your lens and these are the which ligaments? Suspensory ligaments or zonules, right? These are the suspensory ligaments or called zonule. Here is your lens. Now, first you understand the how ciliaris muscle work. Every, most of the muscles when they contract, they have one fixed point and other mobile end, right? For example, when I'm contracting biceps, this is the fixed point and this point is moving the bones. Is that right? In the same way, ciliaris has one fixed point. Ciliaris is fixed over here in the interior part. Ciliaris is present here like a circle, right? It is circular muscle but in section it is looking, this is the interior end of the ciliaris and this is posterior end of the ciliaris. And ciliaris is fixated in the interior end and its posterior end is mobile. The posterior end of the ciliaris is mobile. Now listen carefully. When ciliaris contract, when ciliaris will contract, posterior end will move forward and inward. When ciliaris will contract, this interior end cannot move. So posterior end, when ciliaris muscle will contract and get shortened, it will move forward and inward from both sides. So when ciliaris is contracted, its position become like this, it is shortened. It is shortened muscle and its posterior end is here and here. Suppose contracted muscle has this position and relaxed muscle has this position. Relaxed muscle position we can say it is A dash A and contracted muscle position is B dash B. Now listen, whenever ciliaris muscle will contract, right, uh, these points where suspensory ligaments are attached, they will move forward and inward and tension on the lens will become more or less. Tension will become less. Let me explain. Look, when ciliaris is contracted, right, these are the points where posterior end will move. Right now, the distance between B and B has become less. But whenever ciliaris relaxes, this posterior end move backward and outward. So whenever ciliaris relaxes, there's more distance between A and A and that stretches the suspensory ligament. So this mechanism is very important. Whenever ciliaris relaxes, the ciliaris muscles posterior end move backward and outward and stretch the suspensory ligament and when they stretch the suspensory ligament, lens become flattened. And whenever ciliaris is contracting and it moves forward and inward, right, distance between the ends of the ciliaris become less and suspensory ligament become loose and lens become, yes, 
globular lens become globular so in this position lens it like this right but whenever it contract suspensory ligament become loose is that right when suspensory ligament become loose lens become globular am i clear and whenever le lens is globular you are focusing for near vision whenever lens is flattened you are focusing for far vision now under the stress when sympathetic nervous system is firing you are under stress as i gave you example dog is after you it is midnight and you are running right you have to focus for near vision or far vision you have to focus for far vision to look where are the options to run away to focus for far vision you need lens globular or lens flattened and if you want lens flattened you need ciliaris contracted or you want ciliaris relaxed and if you want ciliaris relaxed ciliaris should have stimulatory receptors or inhibitory receptors it should have inhibitory receptor and you remember the basic principle is all the tissue to be inhibited have beta 2 except few so which receptor should be there on ciliaris beta 2 that's so simple it's very logical so ciliaris muscle should have beta 2 adrenergic receptor and now today you understand how the ciliaris work so now under stress and sympathetic overflow your hair will stand up pupil will dilate ciliaris will relax you will accommodate for far vn and now you come down other changes in the body let's come to now your oral cavity and we talk about changes in your git there what what are the changes now in your gastrointestinal system under what under sympathetic overflow right let's draw the part of gastrointestinal system and we have to see the what changes will be there now in the git there are two types of smooth muscles there are longitudinal smooth muscles and there are circular smooth muscles first we talk about the muscles circular smooth muscles are specially very well concentrated at sphincters you know there is pyloric sphincter and you must be knowing there is ileocecal sphincter and some of you may be knowing there is anal sphincter so these sphincters are there in git isn't it uh, and let's suppose here i draw the longitudinal muscles actually circular muscles and longitudinal muscles are present throughout longitudinal muscles are mainly responsible for peristalsis longitudinal muscles are mainly responsible to initiate the peristalsis then circular also participate in peristalsis we will not go into that detail i just want to know one thing then when dog is after you you are under stress the circular smooth muscles in the sphincter should relax or contract relax you want that you will throw something and horrify the dog very bad it's unfair with the dog dogs have human rights also don't throw things like they are under stress is not the time i mean right so sphincter should contract or relax anal sphincter should be tight under stress even though sometimes autonomic nervous system under stress dysfunction and you pass urine out to something else right it more often happens in the baby that's a dysfunction of nervous system normally in a fully developed mature autonomic nervous system under stress sphincters should tighten up no one should know what's going on isn't it not even dog so of course uh, during when dog is after you or you are under stress git is not going to help you to fight with the dog so this tissue should be inhibited its activity should be inhibited to inhibit the all activity in the git there are multiple steps first of all sphincters should tighten up right if sphincters are tightened up so this is inhibited or stimulated they are stimulated the smooth muscles are stimulated and if the smooth muscles are stimulated there should be stimulatory receptors or inhibitory receptors stimulatory, stimulatory. so which receptor should be there alpha 1 adrenergic receptors that's great so there are alpha 1 adrenergic receptors on sphincters no 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 problem to remember it 
And what about these longer muscles, longitudinal muscles? Longitudinal muscles responsible to initiate the peristalsis. Under stress, you want more peristalsis or you can digest things later on and absorb later on. Yeah, so these muscles should be stimulated or inhibited. Inhibited. And which receptors should be there? Stimulatory or inhibitory? Inhibitory and which receptor should be there? Beta 2. Do you think you need to really memorize it? It all makes logic. Beta 2 and logic receptors. Right? Now we come to the blood supply to GIT. Right? Suppose this is the your general circulation and this is a mesenteric artery coming to GIT. Right? To give the blood supply to GIT. Uh, I cut it here. And here is, yes. <laughs> Here is your blood vessel going to GIT and of course this blood vessel should have smooth muscles in its media, isn't it? Am I right? Now, do you think under stress you need more blood supply to GIT or less? Yes. Less because you have to see, save blood from GIT and divert it maybe to the muscles which can help you to fight with the dog or fly away from the dog. Is that right? So. You want more blood supply coming to GIT and less? Less. Because if there's less blood supply, there will be less secretions, there will be less absorption. We can do these things later, digestion and absorption of the chicken piece. As I told you previously, first we have to save our own leg piece from the dog. So, what really happens, we have to reduce the blood supply to GIT. To reduce the blood supply to the GIT, smooth muscles in the media should constrict or relax. They should constrict. If they should constrict, they should be stimulated or inhibited. Stimulate. If they are stimulated, which receptors should be there? Alpha 1. I don't know why it's people try to memorize it. Alpha 1 adrenergic receptor. It's so logical. In the GIT, in the sphincters, they should be alpha 1. Right? In the GIT, other muscles, they can be beta 2. On the GIT blood flow, mesenteric vessels, they should be alpha 1. They should constrict under stress. No problem? Clear? Claro? Okay, this was something about GIT. And in the same way, when blood supply to GIT is reduced, secretions will be also reduced because the glands need blood supply to produce their secretions. That is why under stress, your mouth becomes dry. You know, when you are under stress, your mouth becomes dry because saliva becomes less blood vessels to sli salivary glands have constricted there's no fun in explaining it anymore is that clear okay uh, so we have seen the hairs will stand up pupil will dilate eyes will accommodate for far vn right and GIT motility will be reduced thank god sphincters will be tightened up and blood flow to GIT will be reduced to divert it to Skeletal muscles. Any question up to here? Then we go down. GID we have discussed. Let's come here. There are lungs in the heart. You want to discuss sympathetic activity in the lungs first or a heart first? It's up to you. Heart first. But which comes first coming down? Lungs. So we do lungs first and then go to the sympathetic activity in the cardiovascular system. So let's talk about respiratory system. So what are the changes in the respiratory system? under sympathetic overflow. One thing is very simple, when sympathetic overflow is within the central nervous system, that will stimulate the respiratory center and respiratory rate will be increased. This is one thing. Secondly, uh, when dog is after you, when you are under stress, you need more oxygen or less oxygen? You need more oxygen right and if you need more oxygen and you will be producing more carbon dioxide so you need to remove look now to circulatory system you have to provide more oxygen and you have to remove more carbon dioxide which is being produced when you are running in front of the dog right so in the stress or stressful circumstances we need more gases going to the lungs. Is that right? For this purpose, what do you think? Bronchioles should constrict or dilate? Dilate. Let's see. I will make a section of this part of the bronchiolar tree. 
I will make a section here, here. This is a suppose bronchiole and we want it to open under stress so that more oxygen can be coming. Now let us talk about what is really there. You know that there are smooth muscles in the bronchioles. There are smooth muscles in the bronchioles. Am I clear? And what do you think? These smooth bronchiolar smooth muscle, they should constrict or they should dilate. So they should be stimulated or relaxed, inhibited. They should be inhibited. And if bronchiolar smooth muscle should be inhibited, so that bronchiolar lumen open up and more gases are coming under stress. So when they are inhibited, they should have stimulatory receptors, inhibitory receptors. So which receptors should be there? Beta 2 receptors. So bronchiolar smooth muscle has beta 2 receptors. There is no trick in that. Beta 2 adrenergic receptors. Bronchiolar smooth muscle that beta 2 adrenergic receptors. When these receptors are stimulated, bronchioles dilate. That is why in patients with asthma, we give the drugs which can stimulate beta 2 receptors so that beta 2 mediated bronchodilation should be seen there. Am I clear? No problem into this? Now we go to your beautiful heart that what happens to your cardiovascular system, right Jess? Okay, Mr. Ronald has come up with the question, what about the blood vessels which are present in the bronchial mucosa and submucosa and all that area, let me explain. I was thinking maybe I can get away but my students are so intelligent, they ask the question. So let me explain it to him. I was just wondering to get away without explaining but you are very clever. Right, so here is, let's suppose your smooth muscle. What is this? This is your smooth muscle bronchiolar. Already we discussed, we want to relax the smooth muscle, we want to open the lumen. We want to open the lumen. If we want to open the lumen, lumen one way is relaxing the smooth muscle. So nature has provided beta 2 adrenergic receptor on these. There are blood vessels also here. There are blood vessels also here, we call them. What are, what are these vessels? Yeah, what type of vessels are these? Are they pulmonary vessels or bronchial blood vessels? These are bronchial blood vessels. Now these blood vessels which are present in bronchial system, right, of course these blood vessels also have their smooth muscle here. Is that right? They have smooth muscle in the wall. Now, uh, to increase the lumen here, you want to shrink the mucosa and submucosa or you should uh, look, if we increase the blood flow here, if we increase the blood flow here, then it will, be, this area will become edematous and hyperemic and this area will swell up and lumen will be reduced. But under stress, you want to reduce the lumen of bronchial tree or increase the lumen? If the, the, you want to increase the lumen, there are two ways. Number one, dilate the bronchial smooth muscle. Number two, reduce the blood supply there. Because if you, these blood vessels constrict, bronchiolar blood vessels constrict, blood flow to this area becomes less. When blood flow to this, this area becomes less, this area is less hyperemic. There is less blood flow, there are less secretions, right? Area become dry and, and lining of the bronchial channels become thin, shrunken. Is that right? And lumen will become wide. So we need to dilate these blood vessels or constrict these blood vessels. Yes, we need to constrict. If we need to constrict these blood vessels, then smooth muscles in this blood, these blood vessels should be stimulated or inhibited. Stimulated. stimulated. Smooth muscle will be stimulated and then it will constrict. So there should be stimulatory receptors or inhibitory. So which receptors should be there? So one adrenergic receptors. So it's so simple. The bronchial smooth muscles Bronchial smooth muscle has beta 2 adrenergic receptor, but bronchial blood vessel smooth muscle has alpha 1 adrenergic receptors. Am I clear? No problem up to this? Now we come and talk about the cardiovascular distribution. Right? Let's talk about the heart first, your beautiful heart.
here are your atria and here are your ventricles right and of the heart you know that there are there what is this here what's present over here sa node and what's present over here av node and what is this this bundle of hairs av node bundle of hairs and bundle branches and then purkinje fibers there's no problem up to this perfectly okay now let's see what is the action of the sympathetic nervous system in the heart first of all we should know that under stressful circumstances heart should be stimulated or inhibited we need more cardiac output or less cardiac output we need more cardiac output you know cardiac output is equal to yes please is equal to stroke volume into heart rate is that right we want to increase stroke volume it, when you are running in front of the dog in stressful circumstances and you are fighting you need a good cardiac output going to your skeletal muscles right so you to increase the cardiac output of course heart rate should be increase heart rate and into increase stroke volume stroke volume mean the volume which is ejected by the ventricle during one pump right the that stroke volume depends on contractility mainly how well it contract now what really happens we have to stimulate the heart so first principle is there should be stimulatory receptor on heart mainly or inhibitory receptors stimulatory receptors and which stimulatory alpha 1 or beta 1 yes beta 1 because we said all the tissues to be stimulated should have alpha 1 except heart juxtaglomerular operators and adipocytes adipocytes right so heart does has stimulatory but not alpha 1 it mainly has beta 1 receptor so receptors here should be yes on sa node there are beta 1 receptors right beta 1 adrenergic receptor and on av node also just a minute on av node also there are beta 1 receptors in Purkinje system also there are beta 1 receptors and of course on the atrial muscle and ventricular muscle there are also beta 1 adrenergic receptor so heart is well decorated by beta 1 receptors so we were talking about that uh, what is the effect of adrenergic system on the heart as we know heart should be stimulated so heart should have stimulatory receptors right either alpha 1 or beta 1 but as you know all the tissue to be stimulated have alpha 1 except heart juxtaglomerular operators and adipose, adipose. adipose cells so heart is one of the exception right so it has beta 1 adrenergic receptors dominantly right so beta 1 adrenergic receptors are present on the sa node av node and on the Purkinje system moreover they are present on the atrial contractile myocardium and ventricular contractile myocardium now what is the effect of this on the heart when sa node is stimulated what is the normal function of sa node sa node is responsible for cardiac automaticity how do you define automaticity automaticity is a property of a tissue to produce depolarizations spontaneously because SA node produces depolarization spontaneously it is normally the pacemaker of the heart when it is stimulated by the adrenergic uh, norepinephrine or epinephrine acting on the beta 1 receptor pacemaker activity will increase right so heart rate will increase so there is increased heart rate due to action here and increased heart rate is called positive chronotropic action chronotropic action chronotropy mean here chronotropy mean related with the normal automaticity 
normal automaticity. So when normal automaticity of the heart is increased, we say there is positive chronotropy. Number one. Number two, there is also stimulation of what is this? AV node. When AV node is stimulated, the conduction through AV node becomes fast. The impulses are conducted fastly from the atria to the ventricle. So we can say under the influence of adrenergic drive, adrenergic stimulation, AV node's conduction velocity increases. And when conduction velocity in AV node and this conduction system increases, we say there is positive, yes please, there is positive dromotropic action. This is called, yes, when conduction through AV node is increased, we say there is positive dromotropic action of the drug or action of the neurotransmitter or action of the hormone, right? How do you remember that it should be called dromotropic? I always think that AV node is like a small drum between the atria and ventricle. So whenever drug stimulate this drum, there is positive dromotropic action. Is that right? No problem into this? Then we can come to the action on the myocardium, right? But before we really go for that, when there is positive chronotropic action, plus there is positive dromotropic action, both of these action lead to increase heart rate. So this component is achieved by increasing by positive, yes, chronotropy and by positive dromotropy. Is that right? Action on SA node, action on AV nodal drum. Now we come to action on the myocardium which contracts, right, atrial myocardium and ventricular myocardium. This myocardium has also beta 1 receptors and this is also stimulated and when they are stimulated, their action is contractility and with them and they will, special when, especially when ventricular myocardium will contract strongly, when ventricular myocardium will contract strongly, of course that will produce more stroke volume. Is it right when it will contract strongly? So increased contractility is called, yes, increased contractility is called positive inotropy, inotropic action, positive inotropic action or positive inotropy. And this factor lead to increase stroke volume. So we can say when epinephrine or when catecholamines or epinephrine and norepinephrine act on the heart, the increase heart rate, increase the conduction through the conduction system, especially AV node, and the increase the contractility, right? And when heart rate is increased and stroke volume is increased due to increased contractility, is increased cardiac output. Is there any question here? There is no question. And of course, whenever cardiac output is increased, systolic blood pressure goes up. You know that or not? We will discuss blood pressure changes in detail when I will teach you the drugs. Right? Drugs mean uh, catecholamines, not other drugs. So we were talking about the effect of sympathetic nervous system on cardiovascular system. We have already discussed the effect on heart. Right? And now we'll talk about the effect of sympathetic nervous system on the vascular system. Right? So let's suppose this is your general circulation, right? From this general circulation, the blood supply is going to, let's suppose, skin. Here is your GIT, right? Then blood supply is also going to the kidney, right? And of course, your beloved skeletal muscle which is going to help you to fight with the stressful circumstances, blood supply is going there and blood supply is of course going to, yes, central nervous system. So we can say that blood vessels, this is blood vessel going to skin, so cutaneous blood flow, this is mesenteric blood flow, this is your renal blood flow and this is blood flow to 
skeletal muscle. Is that right? And of course, here is the blood flow to central nervous system and here is blood flow to heart, coronary system. Now we have to see what happens to all these vascular beds under sympathetic activation, right? Again, as we discussed that sympathetic nervous system is adjusting the tissues and organ in such a way that body should be more appropriately prepared to fight or flight the stress, right? Now under stressful circumstances, as that horrible dog is after you, right? we have to change change the blood flow in different tissues what do you think blood flow to the skin should be increased or decreased it uh, pardon it is decreased or increased people who believe blood flow to the skin should be decreased they should raise their hand okay people who believe blood flow to the skin should be increased they should raise their hand okay so you think you are going to blush off the blush there for the dog Look, blood flow to the skin should be decreased because if blood flow to the skin is increased, you blush there and blood uh, dog is not going to take it. And another thing, if blood flow under the stress increase to the skin and if dog really bite, there will be more bleeding. So under very stressful circumstances, blood flow to the skin decreases. People don't become red, people become pale under fear. Is that right or not? So blood flow to the skin should be decreasing and there are advantages. When cutaneous blood flow decreases, the blood which is saved can be diverted to the muscles. Secondly, reduced blood flow to the skin is good so that if some damage to the skin occur, there should be less bleeding, right? Of course, under some circumstances, blood flow to the cheeks and some areas increases. Those circumstances are really not that is not that dog is after you. That is some sort of romantic stress, you know. Uh, when you blush, isn't it? There was a time women used to blush and skin will become red. Right? That is for different thing. I think more evolutionary that is telling to the man we have good hemoglobin. We can have a baby and everything. Right, I don't know what, but anyway, women blush, it makes them more beautiful, more appealing. Is that right? But these days, if they don't blush, no problem, they have blush on. Isn't it? It works still. Am I right? So, a blushing is not really that life-threatening stress, right? Uh, that is some emot emotional situation for which nature has provided different neuronal connections, that, so that you can appropriately blush, right? But under real stress, blood flow to the skin goes less and when don't actually really blushing is when you are embarrassed sweetly embarrassed right but this is stressful circumstances dog is after you or some examiner is asking you very tough questions and planning to throw you out and you feel like this you don't blush then then you pale isn't it so blood vessels to skin should constrict or dilate Constrict. So smooth muscle of these blood vessels, smooth muscle around these blood vessels should be stimulated or inhibited. So which receptor should be there? Alpha 1. So cutaneous vessels have alpha 1 adrenergic receptors. Right? Then already we have discussed blood flow to the GIT. That should be increased or decreased? Yeah? That should be decreased. That is not the time to increase the blood flow and to the GIT. We should save the blood from the GIT and divert to the muscles. So smooth muscles to GIT vasculature. Smooth muscle in the mesenteric arteries should constrict or relax? It should constrict. You know, you want more blood flow or less? If you want less, it should vasoconstrict or vasodilate. It should visor constrict or smooth muscle should be stimulated or inhibited? Stimulated. stimulated. Which receptors should be there? Alpha 1. Right? Adrenergic receptor. What about renal blood flow? You should increase blood flow to kidney or decrease blood flow to kidney? Right? Decrease blood flow to the kidney as I told you previously. You can make urine later. Right? Uh, in more appropriate when you are relaxed. 
but right now you constrict the renal vessels so that blood can be diverted to the muscles is that right so for here there should be these smooth muscles should be again stimulated or inhibited so which receptor should be there alpha 1 adrenergic receptor remember some people under stress pass out urine that is not kidney function that is a autonomic dysfunction precipitated under stress to the urinary bladder normally urinary bladder under stress should hold the urine it doesn't help to pass out the urine under stress is that right that's a dysfunction anyway come back what about skeletal muscles blood flow you want more blood flow to skeletal muscles or less more so blood vessels to skeletal muscles should constrict or dilate so you need to stimulate the smooth muscle or relax so you should have stimulated receptor inhibitory which one should be there beta 2 adrenergic receptors so this is the action of what adrenergic system sympathetic nervous system on your cardiovascular system and of course we should not forget blood flow to the brain and heart itself cerebral blood flow should increase or decrease when you are under stress it should increase so that blood vessels dilate and produce severe headache do you think it's good when cerebral vessels dilate you precipitate headache did you know that or not all the uh, drugs which dilate the vessels they produce headache right why let me explain and then i will say suppose this is your central nervous system here happily there these are the blood vessels going to your central nervous system right and of course they are passing through these foramina these are the foramina isn't it and in these foramina right uh, you must be knowing that dura mater there is dura mater lining dural sleeve come here do you know that the blood vessels which are entering or leaving the central nervous system in the dural sleeve in the dura mater here there are very high concentration of pain receptors what are receptors here pain receptors so whenever these blood vessels dilate too much they hammer on the they dilate with every pulse they dilate and hammer on the pain receptors on dural sleeve and you feel throbbing headache headache with every pulse isn't it so dilating vessels too much to cerebral system is really not good thing under stress because you will have headache so what should happen to the cerebral blood vessels and if they constrict you will simply with ischemia fall down you know what i am trying to tell you blood flow to central nervous system is so important to the nature it is not left at the mercy of autonomic fluctuation this you should remember blood flow to the central nervous system is so important it is auto regulated by the central nervous system it is not left at the mercy of autonomic fluctuations am i clear so cerebral blood vessels do not have any significant concentration of adrenergic receptors cerebral blood vessels do not have any significant concentration of what adrenergic receptors so sympathetic fluctuations don't control cerebral blood flow cerebral blood flow is auto regulated by the metabolites produced by the brain when central nervous system is working more it produces more metabolite which dilate the cerebral vessels and some part of central nervous system which is not working much that will produce less metabolites and there will be less dilation of the cerebral vessels so i hope you will remember it thank you for remembering it what about coronary blood flow that should increase during the stressful circumstances or decrease that should increase so which receptor should be there alpha 1 or beta 2 i'm talking about not the uh, adrenergic receptors on a heart i'm talking about the adrenergic receptors on coronary blood vessels there should be alpha 1 or beta 2 either there should be none or both should be equal in number you know why coronary blood flow is again so important it should not be left at the mercy of autonomic fluctuation 
coronary vessel diameter is mainly regulated by the auto regulation by the myocardial products when myocardium needs more blood flow it produces the metabolites which dilate the coronary vessels in their branches like cerebral system coronary blood vessels are not left at the mercy of autonomic fluctuations thank god isn't it otherwise you see a girl you get tachycardia sympathetic nervous system is up and then you say oh i get myocardial infarction by the age of 30 maybe we get 40 myocardial infarctions that is not good so the blood vessels the coronary blood vessels to the heart are not left at the mercy of autonomic fluctuation and the most funny thing these blood vessels coronary blood vessels do have adrenergic receptor but the concentration of adrenergic receptors alpha 1 adrenergic receptors and beta 2 adrenergic receptors are same so whenever epinephrine goes there alpha 1 receptors try to constrict and beta 2 receptor try to dilate so there is no significant effect but maybe in prince metal angina you know prince metal angina vasospastic disease of the coronary vessel probably the multiple mechanism one of the mechanism is the beta 2 receptors may be less and alpha 1 receptors will be inherited more we will not talk about that here you will learn that in pathology what i really wanted to tell you the cerebral circulation uh, cerebral vasculature and coronary vasculature again it's worth repeating it is not left at the mercy of autonomic fluctuations by the nature these two vasculature have either very few adrenergic receptors and if they do have adrenergic receptors then stimulatory alpha 1 adrenergic receptors and inhibitory beta 2 adrenergic receptors are in same concentration am i clear any problem here no now let's move forward and learn more about the action of adrenergic drugs or adrenergic system or sympathetic nervous system on other tissues up to now what we have learned you are under stress right so your hair stand up your pupil dilate right your mouth is dry your heart your bronchial yes these are dilated and your heart is stimulated am i right it is stimulated increase heart rate increase and vascular blood flow is also altered is that right and now we should come to some other tissues and about git we have also discussed what will be changes in the git now we'll talk about where what you want to discuss we can talk about metabolic changes in the body or you want to talk about urogenital changes in the body under stress yeah it's your choice okay i leave choice to uh, dr sergio mauri you want to discuss what first you want metabolic changes he shy away you know from the changes in the genital system <laughs> i don't know why but we'll come to that also okay he want to know that what are the metabolic changes in the body when sympathetic nervous system is really working well right okay let's talk about few changes here is your circulatory system right here is your liver one of the very important metabolic organ and of course there must be what is this fat cell adipocyte right and there must be muscle also skeletal muscle right first of all under stress you know one of the very important function of the liver is one of the very important function of the liver is take the glucose and convert the glucose into yes glycogen whenever you are in well fed state when you are in well fed state you have eaten a lot glucose is going to your liver and liver cells are taking up the glucose and making the glycogen and storing the glucose do you think under stress you need to store glucose as glycogen do you need do you think under stress stress you must do glycogenesis no glycogenesis should stop rather glycogen should break down into glucose and glucose should come to the 
blood am i right so glycogenesis should be inhibited so there should be stimulatory receptor inhibitory receptor so there are inhibitory receptors and which receptor should be there beta 2 adrenergic receptors so liver cells have beta 2 adrenergic receptors which give inhibitory signals uh, to stop the glycogenesis and that releases automatically the pathway for the breakdown of glycogen and there is glycogenolysis going on and glycogen breakdown and glucose is coming to the blood. So under stress liver is releasing what? Glucose to the blood so that glucose supply to the muscles and to the brain should be more under stress. This is one thing. Secondly, you know best form in which energy is stored in the body is triglycerides. One glycerol with three fatty acids in the adipocyte. Am I right? In the adipocyte there are triglycerides. Now, do you think there is a muscle here, right, which will break down the triglyceride? It's not muscle of course, there is an enzyme here. This is triglyceride and there is an enzyme here and this enzyme when it is activated this enzyme will break down the triglyceride and release free fatty acids and glycerol isn't it now and of course these free fatty acids are a very good source of energy directly plus this free fatty acid can go into liver and in the liver from fatty acid we can make glucose this pathway is called gluconeogenesis formation of glucose from new sources like formation of glucose from amino acids or formation of glucose from fatty acids right so it means the appropriate metabolic change in the body under stress should be that there should be lipolysis there should be breakdown of the lipid there should be lipolysis and increase free fatty acid level in the blood with that there should be yes please gluconeogenesis so that uh, fatty acids convert into glucose am i really clear so do you think this uh, breakdown of lipids and this lipase this should be stimulated or inhibited stimulated, stimulated. so which receptor should be there stimulatory or inhibitory stimulatory receptor then stimulatory receptor here is yes it is it cannot be alpha 1 because this is an exception so it is beta 1 actually it is really not beta 1 it is modified beta 1 and modified beta 1 these days is called beta 3 adrenergic receptor am i clear no problem in understanding this right so free fatty acids are coming and going there so liver has an organ releasing the glucose it is releasing the glucose by breakdown of glycogen and, right which is called glycogenolysis and it is also releasing glucose by gluconeogenesis right trying to make look at the dog how much changes he has induced in your body isn't it now so your blood glucose level will go up and blood uh, free fatty acid level is also going up and now let's go to the skeletal muscle in the skeletal muscle in the skeletal muscle you know skeletal muscle also store glucose as glycogen do they have glycogen or not okay that's very good thank you for knowing it that skeletal muscle also take glucose to glycogen do you think this process should be stimulated or inhibited inhibited because skeletal muscle are under more action and if skeletal muscles are under more action they need glucose they don't need to store glucose as glycogen they need to break the glycogen back to glucose so this process that glucose should be converted into glycogen should be stimulated or inhibited inhibited so which receptor should be here beta 2 very good beta 2 adrenergic receptors are present on the skeletal muscle cells and that inhibits the glycogen formation and activate the glycogen breakdown so that within the skeletal muscle more glucose is available as energy for contracting and running away from the dog right and of course another thing that when uh, skeletal muscles are having a lot of action depolarization repolarization you know 
there is electrical activity followed by mechanical activity when you are having lot of contractions and running away from the dog uh, skeletal muscles new uh, cell bodies are undergoing depolar action potentials followed by contractions so when there are action potentials going on let's suppose this is one skeletal muscle fiber cell repeatedly action potential going on during every action potential sodium goes yes in sodium in flux produces depolarization right there's sodium in flux and there is loss of during depolarization sodium goes in and during repolarization potassium comes out so actually when muscles are contracting too much what is really happening during every depolarization more sodium is going into skeletal muscle and every repolarization which follows depolarization potassium loss is there and this imbalance is corrected by what is this sodium potassium ATPases which will uh, whatever sodium has gone in they will throw that sodium out and whatever potassium has escaped out that will go in is that right now you tell me something that this process that potassium is being lost during contractions potassium is being lost it should be stopped or it should be accelerated you want to lose more potassium we should bring this potassium back should we bring back or not you know if you are running and sodium is going in and potassium is getting lost this potassium should be brought back is it important or not if too much potassium is lost cell membranes become so electronegative that there is hyperpolarization and muscle cannot be stimulated do you think that should be happen so somehow we should not allow the cell to lose its reserve of what potassium so what really happens that again there are beta 2 receptors here right these beta 2 receptors give signals intracellular multiple signals which eventually lead to phosphorylation of sodium potassium they bring the changes into sodium potassium ATPase and it work more this is very important point when you are losing gaining sodium or losing potassium balance is corrected by whom who correct the balance sodium potassium ATPase so sodium potassium ATPases should be stimulated and if you need to stimulate them what will happen they will throw the sodium out and they will take the potassium in so what really happens in sympathetic overflow sodium potassium ATPases in the skeletal muscle cells are activated and skeletal muscles start taking up the potassium from the blood is that right this is another metabolic change you will learn the significance of this phenomenon uh, later on that in some diseases we give beta 2 stimulant drug the diseases in which muscles lose excessive potassium right now in this case actually receptors are beta 2 not stimulatory but inhibitory receptors are beta 2 so beta 2 receptors are stimulated right and they give intracellular signals here this is an exceptional situation they give intracellular signals which stimulate sodium potassium ATPases so in rapidly contracting muscles and muscles undergoing rapid action potentials right keep on correcting their ionic balance I think you could not understand it clearly yeah, there should be inhibitors yeah, so I understand what's going wrong with your mind actually <laughs> listen life is you can live a good life with general principles but you'll come across situations where there are exceptions there are exceptions this is exception actually your mind is working so that if we have to activate sodium potassium ATPase then we should have stimulatory receptor right here nature has played a trick it is using the same receptor to breaking down the glucose from glycogen same receptor gives signals and alter that right so actually uh, here receptor is not stimulatory it is still inhibitory but intracellular signals are going to stimulate the sodium potassium ATPase this is one exception there are other exceptions also but I don't want to talk about them right now yes in the case of glucose going to glycogen you know that we need to remove that so that's a beta 2 receptor but uh, glycolysis that is breaking down glyco glycogenolysis okay yeah in that case we uh, also use uh, 
uh, look, listen, generally what happens, the enzymes which are converting glucose into glycogen, whenever those enzymes are inhibited, then enzymes breaking down the glycogen are released from inhibitory reaction. They are activated. Because until glucose supply is good and glycogen synth synthetases are working more, then glycogen breaking enzymes are automatically inhibited. But whenever you inhibit the process of glucose to glycogen, then these enzymic pathways inhibited towards this side, these enzymes which are bringing glycogen to glucose, they are released. Right? Yeah, it doesn't, it does not. Now, we move forward. In a nutshell, what we can say, then in the skeletal muscle, not only blood flow is increasing to skeletal muscle, rather uh, skeletal muscle start breaking down glycogen to glucose, plus skeletal muscle is also taking up the potassium from the blood. Is that right? When they, you are exercising too much. Now we move forward. As a general, what are the metabolic changes in the body under adrenergic stress? Metabolic changes are that glucose level in the blood will go up, free fatty acid level in the blood will go up, potassium level will eventually go down, is that right? And glycogen in the muscle will also break down into glucose. Am I clear? There's any problem? There's no. Now we move forward. Okay, I, I would love to mention one more thing. You know, in the muscle, skeletal muscle, there are intrafusal fibers and extrafusal fibers. Extrafusal fibers are the fibers which contract. And intrafusal fibers are like muscle spindles. You know that? These muscle spindles are responsible to maintain the balance and sensitivity of this contractile operators. These are also having beta 2 receptors. And that inhibit the function of muscle spindles. Listen carefully. If I'm keep keeping my hand steady, then there's a muscle tone on agonist and antagonist. And that tone is equal on agonist. Flexors and extensors are equal tone and I'm keeping my hand steady. The tone is maintained well with the help of muscle spindles. Muscle spindle adjusts the sensitivity of the contraction of muscles. Now, when adrenergic activity becomes too much, and beta 2 receptors are stimulated on muscle spindles. Muscle spindles become inhibited and dysfunctional. When they become dysfunctional, you cannot maintain flexor and extensor tone equal. So, sometimes flexor, extensor tone become more, sometimes flexor tone become more, then you correct it by, so they start undergoing tremors. So, that is why under sympathetic overflow or under fear or under anger, you have tremors or even when you are having some drugs which are beta 2 stimulant like salbutamol, terbutaline, albuterol, these drugs also produce tremors. Am I really clear? Right? Any question up to this? Now, if we have discussed this and if Dr. Sergio Ma Mauri allows us, we can talk about the sympathetic action on urogenital system. Yes, doctor. Should we discuss? Okay, thank you for granting permission. Right. So, uh, you want me to discuss male genital system first or female? No, no, no. I leave the choice with Dr. Sergio Mauri. That's action of autonomic nervous system. Ladies first. Ladies first always. I never knew he has such a good taste. Okay. So, we should make a uterus there. Because you cannot imagine a woman without uterus, isn't it? Okay, I will use the different color. Right, so. Here we have uterus of a lady and of course vagina and now we have to see what is the action of autonomic nervous system on the, this, uro, this part of the urogenital system? First of all, you must know that ladies have smooth muscles here in the myometrium. You know myometrium? Right? Now, first of all, about the
myometrial smooth muscle myometrial smooth muscle uh, should contract or they should have stimulatory receptors or inhibitory receptor when they have sympathetic overflow when female has a sympathetic overflow and remember during orgasm there is an intense sympathetic overflow female should have in the myometrium uh, stimulatory receptors or inhibitory receptor no one want to talk about it it is still taboo yeah stimulatory right uh, why is female should have stimulatory receptors on myometrium because during of the, uh, orgasm uh, uterus should have little contraction to take up the semen is that right to facilitate upward movement of the sperms right now uh, according to your theory there should be stimulatory receptors and which stimulatory receptors should be there my friend okay you want to have alpha 1 receptors over there and if alpha 1 adrenergic receptors are present over there your thinking is that that whenever female will have orgasm uterus will contract maybe violently and take up the some material up so this makes some sense but there is one problem eventually the result is female will become pregnant sooner or later and once she become pregnant and pregnant women you know they become angry very soon one of the very important reason is men are unfortunately not really you know when female pregnancy advances and they start looking around right so she is angry and if a pregnant woman undergoes anger burst and uterus contract this beautiful baby will come out and threaten to come out before time do you think it's a good news right it's a very bad news do you think if uterus contract every time a pregnant female undergo stress and uterus contracts right is a good news no female is a wonderful organism she is responsible to maintain our species right baby should be upside down i think you don't know about exceptions <laughs> right okay so yeah you are worried about baby i'm worried about woman right so we are talking about we are talking about that you want to have a uterus which has a lot of alpha 1 receptors and myometrium and whenever she gets angry uterus contract and baby's products of conception are threatened, threatened to come out do you think it's a good situation no so which receptors should be there <laughs> inhibitory so that whenever women get angry sympathetic overflow occur uterus at least relax and her baby should not suffer so you think now another theory has come from another person and the theory is this that we should have inhibitory receptor and inhibitory receptor will be beta 2 adrenergic receptor right now let me tell you the beauty of the nature right the beauty of the nature is as you know female are very clever what they do they express those receptors which they really need female who is not pregnant actually in the nucleus of the this myometrial cell there are gene for alpha receptor as well as gene for beta 2 receptor when female is not pregnant and estrogen and progesterone changes are cyclical right during her monthly cycles then alpha 1 receptors are expressing and she is making more alpha 1 receptors and less beta 2 receptors so in non pregnant uterus even though alpha 1 and beta 2 receptors both are present in the myometrium but the dominant receptors are alpha 1 so that uterus can contract appropriately and enhances the probability of pregnancy conception is that right but when you, female becomes pregnant you know the female behavior before pregnancy and after pregnancy is different many of the wise men know that because her behavior is appropriate for species perpetuation before pregnancies female behavior is to get the right man right and after pregnancy is once she is pregnant her main concern is that pregnancy should go smoothly uneventfully and she should become a great mother that is how they are designed by the nature not only psychologically but even at the uterus level right so what really happened 
when they are not pregnant alpha 1 receptors are the dominant receptors expressed on the myometrial smooth muscle but when females become pregnant hormones change you know estrogen progesterone level become high and they are no more cyclical that signal goes and changes the genomic expression in myometrial cell they switch off the alpha 1 receptor genes and activate the genes for beta 2 receptors and pregnant females uterus has more beta 2 receptors in myometrial cell than alpha 1 receptor am i clear so that whenever she gets angry it does not threaten the baby am i right and this thing this all why i explain so much because it has some clinical relevance my friend the relevance is that when there is female is threatening to undergo premature labor no sometimes they they have premature contraction and there is premature labor right for example just on 25th week or 27th week uterus start contracting as a doctor you would like to increase the contractions of uterus or you want to relax the uterus and inhibit the contractions relax and which receptor is there to relax the uterus so which drug should be given drug which is beta 2 stimulant actually there is a drug called ritodrine which is beta 2 receptor agonist so females who threaten to not female female uterus which threatens to start labor prematurely one of the treatment is you give the female injection of ritodrine ritodrine will go and stimulate yes beta 2 receptors in my material cells and beta 2 inhibit mediated relaxation of myometrial cell will occur and premature contractions will stop am i clear no problem up to this so this was something about the uterus about the secretions in vagina i will not go into detail except that uh, male erection and female secretions in vagina both are functionally and neurologically operated in the same way when male get Uh, excited or stimulated sexually they develop erection in their organ when female get uh, stimulated or excited sexually uh, they produce more secretions in their vagina both these mechanisms in male and female are stimulated by parasympathetic nervous system they are stimulated by parasympathetic nervous system but in male ejaculation and in female orgasm is mainly mediated by sympathetic nervous system and for sympathetic nervous system we'll talk later in detail when we talk about the male urogenital system so this was something about the uterus and vaginal secretions and we have to talk about urinary bladder also isn't it there what about urinary bladder okay here you have i think i should remove this it is disturbing your attention now we will make a urinary bladder and we'll see what really happens to yeah it's beta 2 uh, delivery is operated by different mechanism uh, females don't deliver the baby due to sympathetic activation there were different mechanisms oxytocin is released we'll discuss it in gyne of one day right now we have to make a this is urinary bladder right and now in urinary bladder there are muscles here these muscles of urinary bladder are called detrusor do you know that or not detrusor and of course there is oh my god there should be internal urethral sphincter also very very important here is your internal urethral sphincter
right now this is your internal urethral sphincter and this is your right now we have to talk about two things number one when you are under stress and dog is after you or any big thing what do you think you want to pass urine or you want to retain urine while you are running it's not really very appropriate to pass the urine so if you want to hold your urine uh, what do you think sphincter should uh, the trouser should contract or relax relax of course uh, the trouser should relax and sphincter should contract it means the trouser muscle should be inhibited and sphincter muscle should be stimulated am i right so when you the trouser should be relaxed so that it does not push the urine forward so there should be stimulatory receptors here or inhibitory inhibitory which inhibitory will be there yeah there are beta 2 so actually the trouser have beta 2 adrenergic receptors but during stressful circumstances sphincter should be tight so if sphincter should be stimulated or inhibited and if should be stimulated then stimulatory receptor or inhibitory receptor stimulatory receptor which one should be there alpha 1 I don't know how you know it so well now there are alpha 1 adrenergic receptor right so it's very easy to understand that in the urinary bladder the trouser muscle has beta 2 receptors and internal sphincter has alpha 1 receptor so that when you are under stress the trouser should relax and sphincter should contract but of course there are example when someone under stress he passes the urine out or she passes the urine out especially in children that is a dysfunction of autonomic nervous system am i clear sometimes autonomic nervous system also gets confused right and the trouser contract and sphincter relax an unfortunate situation develop right so this was something about what urogenital system about the male urogenital system uh, I told you ejaculation is yes sympathetic mediated right so during ejaculation the smooth muscles in the prostate and vas deferens and other areas because they have to ejaculate their semen those smooth muscles should contract or relax they should contract if those smooth muscles have to contract uh, in the male uh, genital system then those smooth muscles should have stimulatory receptors or inhibitory receptors stimulatory receptor which stimulatory receptors should be there yes alpha 1 there is no problem so there is no fun in remembering that prostate has alpha 1 receptor prostate has alpha 1 receptor logically it should have alpha 1 adrenergic receptor because prostate smooth muscle the vas deferens smooth muscle need to contract to expel the male uh, you can say semen so uh, there should be alpha 1 receptors over there that is why men are really not very happy with alpha 1 blocker drugs there is no need to explain it you understand why they are not happy with alpha 1 blocking drug that's good so Ronald understand that and now the last thing which I should not forget I told you that all the tissues to be stimulated have alpha 1 receptors except heart which have beta 1 juxta glomerular apparatus and adipocyte I did not discuss juxta glomerular apparatus let's talk about that you must be knowing juxta glomerular apparatus is present in kidney isn't it and in the kidney one kidney has how many juxta glomerular apparatus actually with every nephron there is one juxta glomerular apparatus so this is one nephron right and you must be knowing that this is your what is this afferent arteriole some smooth muscle from afferent arteriole and some special cells from here macula densa with some other cells called lacy cell all of these together make this apparatus which is called juxta glomerular apparatus major function of juxta glomerular apparatus is to release what they release renin and you must be knowing that 
renin will go into blood, convert angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1, which will pass through the pulmonary capillary and expose to pulmonary capillary endothelium, which will have enzyme angiotensin converting enzyme, which will convert angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. And angiotensin 2 will lead to vasoconstriction plus angiotensin 2 will lead to the release of aldosterone which will lead to the retention of salt and water. So do you think when you are under stress, for example dog is after you, you want to take your blood pressure up or down? Up. So vaso, uh, it means angiotensin 2 should be more. It means eventually renin should be more. Secondly, under stress you should retain salt and water because under extreme stress in jungle life there are chances you will get damage and you may bleed. So you re start retaining salt and water to keep your volume protected in future, right? So aldosterone has to be more. So under stressful circumstances, uh, renin should be released more so that eventually vessels should constrict under the influence of angiotensin 2 and uh, kidney retains salt and water under the influence of aldosterone. So renin juxtaglomerular operators should be inhibited or stimulated? Stimulated. So stimulatory receptors, inhibitory receptors. Which stimulatory receptors? Beta 1, not alpha 1. I told you all the tissues to be stimulated should have alpha 1 except heart, juxtaglomerular operators and adipocyte. So there are beta 1 adrenergic receptor present over there on juxtaglomerular operators. Again it is important to remember why sometimes as antihypertensive drug you may take propranolol or you may take atenolol. They block the beta 1 receptor here and reduce the renin output and they have many other actions also. We will talk that later when we study the drugs. Is there any question? No? Class dismiss. Thank you.